Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We'll be getting the program in one minute. Good morning. Uh, our program is about to begin. Precision Medicine aims to match patients to therapies tailored to their unique biological characteristics. To achieve this, doctors rely on diagnostic tests that provide vital insights into each patient's individual traits. The complexity of these tests, combined with varying regulatory requirements, can create challenges in determining if different tests measuring the same marker yield consistent results. This variability makes it difficult for healthcare providers to personalize treatments and provide the best possible care to their patients. Friends of Cancer Research is stepping in to establish unique partnerships that assess and mitigate diagnostics test variability to inform policy and improve consistency in health outcomes for everyone. Our collaborations provide important insights into the performance accuracy and consistency across diagnostic tests to shape future policies and regulations. At Friends of Cancer Research, we acknowledge the complexities, harness the potential, and champion the power of diagnostic tests to support precision medicine. As health technology continues to rapidly evolve, our work becomes even more critical. Together, we're committed to untangling the complexity of diagnostic tests to improve patient care. Good morning, thanks for coming. I'm Ellen Siegel, Chair and Founder of Friends of Cancer Research. And we're happy to be discussing a very complex and very important uh, uh, topic today, the future of diagnostic tests. We're excited to be hosting critical discussions today with everyone in the room and over a thousand virtually, four, well actually 1,400. And if my lipstick is smudged, let me know. Um, since starting Friends 27 years ago, our priority then and now has always been to improve the lives of patients. As technology rapidly advances and diagnostic tests continue to become more complex, and they are really complex and important, it is absolutely critical that patients and providers receive accurate and consistent information to inform care decisions. At Friends, we have built the evidence by collaborating with leading diagnostic developers to support assay innovation and harmonization. This data has informed the debate around legislative action that we have championed for many years. Unfortunately, Congress once again did not act to pass valid act this past year. We are not happy about that and we're not giving up. In the absence of congressional action, FDA has been uh, taken strong steps towards helping to assure the validity of tests that are impacting patients' lives. So I'm very happy that FDA is not giving up and moving on this because this is crucial to patients. I cannot stress this enough. These tests are aiding real life treatment decisions between patients and their physicians. 
they have to be accurate and we need standards and methodology to, to do whatever patient to go, so whatever a patient is treated, they get the right result. This is crucial in their treatment and it's based on an accurate diagnostic. There is no patient that goes into an office or frankly most doctors in a community setting that ask if the test is accurate. The assumption is it is accurate. I have been doing this for a long time and people call me all the time and I've never heard anyone say, well, do you think the test I have is accurate? They may question the treatment, but never the test. So we need to make sure that doctors and the patients know their treatment decisions are accurate based on accurate testing. Uh, now to start off today's meeting, we have very special guests who deeply understands this and frankly, who has devoted his life to this. He has been a pioneer revolution, revolutionizing safety, effectiveness, and quality of medical devices at the Food and Drug Administration. Well, if you don't know he, who he, that is, that's Jeff Shoren. He's the director of FDA's CDRH. He is relentless, working night and day towards the goal of better science and better patient care and accuracy. Since joining the FDA in 1998, Jeff has been instrumental in leading countless initiatives that have truly transformed the agency. Of critical importance uh, to our work and efforts was the reauthorization of the medical de uh, device user fee. Speeding up the authorization of potentially life-saving life treatments for patients. I am truly honored to have you join us and look forward to, to hearing uh, how the FDA is ad addressing the, uh, a sea change in medical uh, technology. And thank you, Jeff, and thank all of the people that you're working with for your steadfast dedication to patients and science. We are very honored. Um, it's a pleasure to have a chance to open up this, uh, this conference, and I thought I'd take um, the opportunity to talk about some of the things at CDRH. There's a lot going on, so I'm going to touch just on a few things, some very specific to diagnostics and oncology, some to diagnostics a little bit more broadly, but have implications for oncology, and then some things for medical technologies writ broadly, but also have some implications for diagnostics for oncology. So with that, let me, uh, let me start with, uh, I guess, the elephant in the room. Um, laboratory developed tests. Um, and let me just spend a few minutes here. Not a lot I can say since we're in the midst of rulemaking, but as many of you know, maybe all of you know, the agency has long held uh, that we have oversight on in vitro diagnostics. Um, and that under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act does not make a distinction on who makes the test, um, so all IVDs. As a matter of policy, though, when we were setting up the program almost 50 years ago, um, we decided not to enforce requirements for tests made by laboratories for use in the laboratory, that laboratory at the time, and those tests then were lower risk, very much dependent on the skills of the laboratorian, and just used very locally. It was a much different world than what started to happen over the years. And for many years now, we've been looking to pull back on that enforcement discretion approach because we've seen issues around laboratory-developed tests that are not analytically, clinically, or both valid at the end of the day. And that has been across a number of disease conditions and also pertains in the space of oncology. Um, on the flip side, we've also seen impacts on innovation, uh, where non-laboratories don't have the incentives for making needed tests because, and particularly in the case of companion diagnostics, many of which are for oncology, non-laboratories, we've seen them. They make a test, and the next day a laboratory comes out and says, well, I have a test. Not only is that test, it's better. So why go ahead and make the investment and even do the science behind it? And that just disenfranchises so many patients. And that has to change. In fact, today, with some reports about variability in test performance in this space, whether or not you get the right treatment 
for your cancer can depend more on the laboratory you get tested in than on your tumor biology. And I personally believe that should be a never event. So uh, we have moved to take actions over the past few years. About a decade ago, we moved forward administratively with a series of guidances. We got feedback that, uh, from members of Congress, members in the community, that a legislative solution may be more helpful not only to provide clarity as we were planning, but also to put in place more modern framework for IVDs. And we worked with members of Congress, members in the community, for many years, about seven years, a little biblical, um, and we got close with legislation, but not over the finish line, kind of an unclear path ahead. And we felt with what we were seeing on impact to patients, to people, that we needed to move forward. So we picked up again administratively and we issued a regulation last year. We did a regulation because we heard folks wanted to have an economic analysis. It's not something we had to do, but we did this to be responsive. It still just provides clarity at the end of the day. Um, a few things in the rule itself, it sort of, if you will, phases out that enforcement discretion approach over a period of time. It does leave it in place for certain kinds of tests, um, and it asks questions about whether we should continue an enforcement discretion approach in whole or in part for other kinds of tests or entities. We leave it wide open, but we ask some targeted questions about tests that are currently on the market. As we've heard concerns, you pull everything in, it may be disruptive. Two, certain public health scenarios like emerging uh, pathogens, uh, always look at smaller entities, uh, and in this case, whether a phase-out period should be a little longer. We've heard very clearly from academic medical centers uh, concerns there that they are unique and different uh, because of providing integrated health care, and that that provides additional mitigations, uh, particularly important in the case of unmet needs. And finally, that uh, there are some programs out there that provide greater oversight on laboratory-developed tests, like New York State Department of Health, um, who they themselves also perform a pre-market you know, uh, review on individual tests, uh, very similar to the FDA. So all of that is out, has been out for comment, and we got lots of comments. Over 6,500. Uh, many of these are form letters, but there are plenty that are unique comments um, from a wide range of uh, stakeholders. Uh, and the bottom line is the perspectives are all over the map. So where do we go from here? We are moving forward to finalize uh, the regulation. Now, in the interim, though, I mentioned you know this challenge that we have with tests that are being used to inform the selection of a drug treatment. Uh, for cancer. And as an interim step, last year we put out a guidance document with our colleagues in the Oncology Center of Excellence to start a pilot um, to address uh, some of the current concerns we've been seeing about, you know, variable performance. And essentially that guidance says, look, as a drug company, um, you can participate in this pilot if you so choose, whereby you would provide us with the data on performance for the tests being used in your pivotal study. We'd look at the data and we tried to come up with sort of some minimum performance specifications based upon that. Um, and again, as an interim step, and if we put that out there, maybe we can better assure we've got tests performing better. But again, we're not seeing data on that. It's not assuring that there's you know, adequate validation at the end of the day and no, in fact, it really works as intended. Um, where do we stand today? We don't have any companies in the pilot. We have a number who have approached us. We are in discussions. Some of the challenges, though, is they may not know what test is being used in the study. And where they know, uh, to date, haven't had laboratories who have been willing to share the data so we can look at it. So I don't know where the pilot is going to ultimately end up. Uh, but again, this is kind of an interim step as we move forward with regulation. All right. So yesterday, we put out an announcement to express our intent to reclassify most of the in vitro diagnostics that are high risk. So essentially moving it from a high risk test to a moderate risk test. The reason being, based on our experience, we think we can still assure those tests 
are safe and effective. They are analytically and clinically valid with appropriate mitigations, what we call special controls, in place. And by having a more streamlined approach available, that can stimulate more innovation for those kinds of tests. And most of those tests are companion diagnostics and tests for infectious disease. We also think, based on our experience moving forward, that most of the tests to come will likely, that otherwise might have been in high risk category, will move to moderate risk. So we will move forward. We wanted to get that out there so folks understand, because it is a lengthy process with rulemaking and advisory panels, but uh, we will proceed and move forward. Now, one of the other programs uh, that we have launched as a pilot pertains more broadly to technology, but it has implications for diagnostics. Uh, and this is our total product life cycle advisory program. You make medical technology today, you've got a lot of hurdles to get through, lots of challenges to go from concept to commercialization. There is a reason, as folks well know, that it is called the valley of death. And FDA is just one stop along that journey. And we have seen repeatedly, sort of in the med tech space, how many times developers are not taking into account all the different aspects they need to have to have a good strategy, to be efficient in their evidence generation. And that's even fairly sophisticated players. Uh, that is starting with including the voice of patients in the design and the evidence generation for the technology, understanding the needs of providers at the outset, not just understanding what may be important to the FDA, but so you can take that into account to support adoption in the marketplace, the needs of the payers. And today, too often technology, it takes years, even on good technology, particularly innovative technology, to ever get covered and reimbursed. And that creates disincentives at the front end to invest in innovative technology, and that is just a disservice to patients at the end of the day. So TAP tries to deal with that. How? Three big aspects. We have a new position. We call it a TAP advisor. And these are folks who are there to engage more as strategists proactively with the developers, identifying the key issues and challenges to deal with, uh, working with them on potential solutions. Uh, and doing this in a very fluid manner, in fact, that's the second part of this, that our review team is engaging differently. Today, you can come meet with us on any topics at any stage in the life cycle. That is wide open. We don't leave it to one stage, but it's a stage gate approach because you come in the door, and you say, here are my questions, here's the information I have. We'll schedule that typically you know, within 70 days, address them, and then if you have more questions, you can come back in the door. In COVID, in the pandemic, we did this in a much more fluid manner with our pre-EUAs. That kind of approach is baked into TAP, that the engagements are much more fluid. In fact, we have cases now, folks in the pilot, they were literally talking several times a week to work through issues. And the third part is if, again, the company is interested, um, we will connect you with relevant patient groups, provider groups, and building some of those relationships with payers. So that is a very separate conversation. So the pilot has been launched. We started with cardiovascular devices year before. Uh, this fiscal year, uh, we rolled in neurological, psychiatric, and uh, rehabilitation medicine devices. And we will be expanding it in October to other parts of the center. And it will uh, uh, wind up including diagnostics in this program. The feedback so far has been very, very, very positive. One company, we already, within a few weeks, saved them a year, what they need to do. Because this is about improving the predictability and reducing the time and cost of that valley of death. And if you're going to fail, better to fail fast and put your energies elsewhere. So that is TAP, has big implications. Final area that I want to touch on is health equity, uh, one of our strategic uh, priorities. The aspects here overlap with our sister medical product centers at the FDA on three of these four prongs. We've all been working together on reducing barriers for people to participate in clinical evidence generation. 
We're all looking at ways to better empower diverse populations with the information they need and the way they need it to make well-informed decisions. And we're all looking at spurring innovation to address gaps and unmet needs across diverse populations. Where we're unique at CDRH is our particular focus on access. You can have the greatest care in the world, but if you don't have access to it, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. And we all know we have lots of challenges with our health care here in the U.S. Uh, we as a nation, as you have heard, we spend more money per individual than any other developed country, and we die younger. So we get to pay more and get less at the end of the day. That's where we are. And a good part of it are people who don't get access to care. And that's not going to change, you know, if our system continues to be based on, one, just a focus on care. We, we are focused on the people who are sick. What about preventing it in the first place? We don't do a good job on prevention or wellness. And we are very focused on care being in your brick and mortar healthcare institutions. But many people don't have access to that. And there are cost issues around it. So what we're doing at the FDA is we're looking about how do we transform that healthcare delivery? How do we move care out of healthcare institutions and take it to where people are? You say, at home, at home, at work, at play, at the end of the day. Um, and that is not simply about technology, taking it from an institution and dumping it in a home setting. There are institutions today, centers, that are doing that because that's the best they got. It's lift and shift. And you're jerry-rigging around the home. But people can't have a lot of technologies. Clinicians can't have tons of technologies thrown at them. You just can't handle it. The home environment is not set up for it at the end of the day. And technologies have to be fit for purpose because those technologies not only bridge between a person and their provider, but provide the opportunities for screening, for diagnosis, for management, for supporting wellness, for treatment intervention at the end of the day. And the opportunity for gathering data because we're all focused on how do we move clinical studies to have decentralized features where data is collected where you are as much as possible and you're not traveling into trial sites, which again limits who participates, particularly the most underrepresented, the underserved. Uh, we put out a docket to gather comments on some of the things that we're doing. We got uh, terrific feedback on this. Um, and we have also made this a uh, center-wide priority, key aspects of being uh, coordinated with our Digital Health Center of Excellence because digital health technology is really a linchpin here. We've been authorizing these kinds of devices for years. In fact, of those, over 650 are already artificial intelligence, machine learning enabled, and that includes for diagnosis and for treatment. And those numbers are just skyrocketing. Um, Kind of in this space for relevance, um, we've already seen you know, digital health uh, technologies in diagnosis. I've given some examples here in the oncology space. And of course, on the treatment side as well. I know we're focused on diagnosis, but never want to miss out on treatment. This also goes to imaging technology uh, as well, to uh, not only to be able to connect experts um, with more uh, remote locations, but to make technology mobile. There's now a CT scanner you can put in a van and you can bring it around to communities. And where we are headed though, is you gotta start bringing some of this to the home. I don't know if we're gonna have a CT scanner in your home, <laughs> but we will have ultrasound at the end of the day, right? And you will have AI that's helping to guide people, but you have to design the technology for people, right? We need consumer technology that's medical grade. And that is part of our focus here, where we are going. Because I need something, if I'm gonna do anything, that's as simple as this. That's what it has to be. Not the, um, I have all this complexity. And that is solvable. And then of course, 
tests, in vitro diagnostics. Um, one of the silver linings of COVID is that the U.S. is much more comfortable with over-the-counter tests. You know, prior to this, there's still a lot of concerns from both consumers and providers about people having, you know, using tests at home. Some, everyone's been comfortable with a home pregnancy test, but for many others, no. But COVID has really changed that, and so we are now seeing more uh, tests coming through that will be over the counter. It's not just for COVID, for other infectious diseases, um, you know, drugs of abuse, and that will continue to expand. But again, more and more, these have to be designed for a lot of people to be able to use. We let tests go on the market for COVID over the counter. They're, they're fine, but you know what? A number of, for them generally, um, if you are um, disabled, you know, you have arthritis, trying to open up a little screw top or squeezing drops in, you can't do that. That's not the way to go. So really have to reimagine a lot of these tests too. And the implications for oncology, we should, when we have the tests, test people in the home. You want to find cancer as early as possible. That's where we can make a huge difference in people's lives at the end of the day. And it's got to be accessible for everybody. That means it's got to be in the home. And on top of it, as we continue to understand what we can do to prevent or reduce the likelihood, that also has to be there for people so they can make those choices. And then it's on evidence generation, too. So we are looking at key things on when you redesign the home. So this isn't just individual shock. It's got you have to rethink the home, but in a way that is a person's home. You can't push things on them. Um, so you're going to be hearing more in the coming months about some of our efforts that we are taking about then what does that mean for the home setting to allow for it. And one of it, too, is how then you can set up so that if a person wants to be in a clinical study, in fact, they should know about the clinical study from their home, then essentially you get the clinical trial in a box to plug and play and keep it simple. And that's an opportunity for expanding participation. Finally, I'll just end that uh, pretty much all of our work we do with partners. You know, it's, uh, as I've heard the uh, a African proverb, if you want to go fast, you do it alone, but if you want to go far, you do it together, and we want to go far. So I've just highlighted here just some of the things that we're doing collaboratively. I just wanted to mention one in particular. It's these collaborative communities. Uh, this is something that we sort of formulated a few years ago, and we put it out as a priority, strategic priority a few years now ago, and now it's baked into how we do business. And more traditionally, for government, we tend to be command and control, right? We got something, we're in charge, we're driving it, you know? You can come to our party, but you're guests. Um, here, we, here we're saying no, um, and this is kind of personal. If we're a truly representative government, then we need people participating, not just, you know, every few years you get to vote. So this pulls people in from the community, the key stakeholder groups, and top on that list is patients being at the table with an ongoing forum that the FDA does not run. We don't run it. We are a member of the community and we sit there as a member. And if the community has sort of a shared solution and it's in the best interest of public health and not contrary to our statutory mandate, don't want to piss off Congress, then we'll go ahead and adapt, adopt it and do it. And to date, we are now, we've set out sort of um, some guidelines, things to think about if you wanted to set one of these up, even a draft charter to put it together. You got a whole toolkit up on our website, and we are now participating in 15 of these. Hopefully in the next few weeks, it'll be up to 16. And some of these do have relevance in the oncology space. I just mentioned one on digital measurement collaborative. And of course, uh, uh, this pathology innovation is a big focus on digital pathology. If there is interest in the community for certain areas that collectively we need to solve, collaborative community can be a very successful way to do it to assure everyone has a seat at the table and everyone has their voice heard. So with that, I'm going to stop. 
Um, we just have uh, two minutes left, and I will uh, open up if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so many academic centers uh, develop their own diagnostic tests through the New York State accreditation. In comparison, how different would the, this process be at the federal level, and would there be additional requirements? So there are a lot of similarities um, with the New York uh, State program and ours. Um, they, we each sort of leverage um, CLIA in certain ways. Um, one aspect that's a little bit different than us, we do have a focus on what we call design controls. So that when you're making a test at the outset, you have done it in a, a much, in a well thought through, more formulated manner to assure that or reduce the likelihood of having design flaws. Um, one big thing to highlight with New York State, you know, they pointed out that from their experience over 30 years, less than half of the submissions that come in the door, they don't authorize on a first pass. You know, they continue to find issues with usually design flaws at the outset, you gotta go fix your test, or issues around a poor validation, and so the data just doesn't support it, and that's been a big problem. Um, or what's getting reported is, is misreported. It's not the right performance that's out there, or it's just not supported by the evidence at all. It's the same experience that we have seen by others. It's our own personal experience, too, for LDTs that we've seen. That is not to say LDTs have an important, you know, their role in healthcare. And no one's, we're not questioning from that. But you got to make sure those tests at the end of the day are accurate and reliable. New York State has had the same experience as we have had, um, but also a lot of similarities in how they approach it. All right. Maybe I'll just take one more, because I know I've got seven seconds. Great. I'll try to make it fast. But good morning. Mark Flurry from ACS CAN. Uh, I wanted to see if maybe you'd say a few more words about the oncology pilot. Um, the idea is setting some performance standards for LDTs that are essentially serving as companion diagnostics for cases where there isn't a companion diagnostic. That was obviously announced uh, prior to the announcement uh, of the plans to end enforcement discretion and, and essentially bring LDTs in. So it, it, it feels like maybe there's some tension between that pilot and sort of the uh, interest in, in ending enforcement discretion. So I wondered if you might talk a little bit about that tension or how you sort of view that program in light of the broader um, end of a enforcement discretion. Yeah, no, good question. Um, so we don't, we don't see the tension. Um, and I know what the public sort of sees in terms of when announcements occur. Obviously, before those announcements occur, there's a lot going on in the agency beforehand. So we're really looking down the road uh, and knowing that the actions that we are looking to take are going to take time ultimately to be in place. So that pilot we sort of view for now as an interim step. Um, and the pilot is, you know, I've told you, it's kind of stuck in neutral for the moment. We'll see if we're able to move forward. But again, that's not, at the end of the day, that's not an end all be all solution at all. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sharon, for being here this morning uh, and for sharing your insights into what will now, no doubt be a busy few months. Um, let me start our sessions today by uh, thanking all of you for joining us today, uh, either in the room or online. Um, we have several great sessions lined up, as you can see uh, from your agenda at your seat today, um, and another terrific keynote during our lunch session. So thank you for all, to all of our panelists and speakers today. Given the large audience that is joining us online, we'll be doing our best to stay as close to the agenda times as possible, and we appreciate everyone's assistance with that. For our panels, uh, if time allows, we hope to provide the opportunity for audience questions. So for those of you in the room, please feel free to use the mics that will be set up in the aisles after the panel's uh, initial discussions. And if you're online, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit a potential question for our panelists. We ask that before you ask your question, you identify yourself by name and affiliation and try to keep your questions succinct and preferably on topic. 
So let's go ahead and get started. Um, our first session features new results from a biomarker harmonization project that, that we have had the privilege of working on with our collaborators over the last several months. Portions of this project have been presented at leading scientific conferences, but this is the first time that this study will be presented in full, followed by a deep dive with our, our, several of our partners on the panel today. This has been a remarkable collaboration. It features the work of 17 innovative developers, labs, experts from FDA, NCI, leading academic institutions, and patients that have been involved in this process. As you'll hear further, homologous recombination deficiency is a complex biomarker with a growing number of applications in cancer research and care. Our partners came together to share data using a common set of ovarian cancer samples to determine the extent to which there is variability between the different tests. The goal is to further characterize and optimize the use of HRD and helping to inform treatment decisions. We are so appreciative of all of our partners' commitment to advancing the complex science and ultimately improving patient care. I am very pleased now to introduce our amazing project leader who has shepherded this project along with great expertise, uh, Friends of Cancer Research Director of Regulatory and Research Partnerships, Dr. Hilary Andrews, to present the findings from this collaboration. Thanks, Jeff. It's an honor to be here. We've been working on this project for over two and a half years, and here are some of our final findings. Um, as Jeff mentioned, homo homologous recombination deficiency, or HRD, is a biological phenomenon that is used as a complex biomarker that helps identify patients who might benefit more from a PARP inhibitor. So what do we mean by that? We call this uh, biomarker complex because developers assess different measurable indicators to create an HRD score. In this case, they're using causes or HRR, homologous recombination um, repair pathway alterations in those genes, or consequences or the downstream effect of having those alterations, things like um, loss of heterozygosity. The uh, patients involved in this study are those with ovarian, um, uh, pancreatic, breast, and prostate cancer. Uh, we say that they benefit more because it's improved recurrence-free survival or overall survival. And PARP inhibitors are a class of drugs that target DNA repair mechanisms. So the challenges of this biomarker is that the complexity leads to different definitions of what constitutes HRD. There are different assays that have different cut points or thresholds, and that leads to inconsistency in how HRD is measured and interpreted by patients and providers. There's variability in HRD measurements, and that may impact treatment decisions and ultimately patient outcomes. And so friends established the HRD harmonization project to overcome some of these challenges by asking the question, are HRD assays results consistent across different assays, and what factors contribute to any observed variability? We have three phases of the project. In phase one, we published a landscape assessment in the oncologist that um, looked at some of the definitions of HRD and the assays that are used to define it. During phase two, our assay alignment, we had an analysis of HRD assays assessing shared data sets, and we had two different data sets. The first was an in silico analysis that we previously presented at the AMP conference in 2022, and the clinical analysis, which is what I'll focus on for today. And finally, interpreting and sharing the findings. The group up here are all part of the HRD working group, and that working group um, met biweekly throughout the past two and a half years to talk about those results. Um, and we're here to share them today at this public meeting, and we have a publication that's forthcoming. So our for our study design, we distributed freshly extracted nucleic acids from 90 archival ovarian cancer samples. This, the patients had either stage 3 or stage 4 high-grade serous ovarian cancer. They were all treatment naive, but they subsequently received platinum-based chemotherapy. We did have a few patients who received PARP inhibitors, but it was a very few number um, due to the timing of the study. It was from patients from 2012 to 2022. The assay developers independently sequenced the samples and then measured and reported HRD. And we asked the 17 developers to provide us with some information about their assays. They all assessed BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations to define HRD. The cutoffs for HRD and the range of the values that they reported uh, varied. And we had, um, we also asked them about what factors they included to define HRD, and the graph on the bottom right shows um, GLOH, TI, and LST are all consequences, um, and mutations is referring to mutations in HRR pathway genes. Um, and you can see there's a variety of different responses for those as well. The NCI Biometric Research Program compared the results to determine the level of agreement, and our working group reviewed and aligned on findings. 
A key aspect of our analysis is that we lack a gold standard for HRD, so we focused on uh, observed variability in the assays. So because we lack that gold standard, we assess concordance using percent positive agreement, or PPA. The percent, uh, PPA is the percentage of samples that test positive by one test that are found to be positive by a second test. We also calculated the negative percent agreement, or NPA, as well as APA and ANA. For these assessments, we use HRD as positive, and we use not HRD as negative. And I've included an example here where I show each row is a different assay, and each column is a different patient. And when we perform our, our calculations across all possible combinations of samples and assays, we end up with six different values. Because we had 17 assays, we performed 272 comparisons for APA and ANA. So then we looked at the distribution of those values, as well as the median and interquartile range, which are included at the bottom of this graph. The graph depicts each dot as a pairwise comparison, and you can see that the median interquartile range, um, median and interquartile range for PPA was 83, and then the, for NPA, it was 80. So we um, aligned on the output that agreement is moderate overall. We also assessed the impact of several clinical assay and sample characteristics on concordance. And here I'm showing you the results when we looked at just the samples that had a, a BRCA mutation versus those samples that had wild type BRCA. And what you'll see is that agreement is better for the samples, so the PPA is higher for the samples that have a mutated BRCA1 and BRCA2 compared to the wild type BRCA1 and BRCA2. We performed additional subgroup analyses to understand the impacts of clinical sample and assay characteristics on the level of agreement. Um, and so we looked at CCNA1 amplification because we know that it uh, is usually mutually exclusive from HRD um, as well as um, BRCA. And we saw that samples with CCNA1 amplification have better agreement for not HRD calls. Um, when we looked at race, debulking status, tumor purity, to, uh, DNA quality, and the age of the black, we did not see associations with agreement. And for the assays, about half of them were used for research use only, while the other half are used in the clinic, and we did not see differences in the outputs there. Now for HRD cutoff, we were interested because we know we have these various different cutoffs for the groups, um, so we performed an analysis where we created an average concordance score. So here, each circle represents an individual patient where we calculated their average concordance score by um, looking at all of the results from the assays for that individual patient. And then we mapped it across the HRD score for that individual assay. These are two representative um, assays of the overall data set. But what we can see is that there's less agreement near the cutoff, which is that, that red line, um, than we see at the ends. Um, and the lowest smoothing curve is the blue line, indicating the trend for the overall data within that um, individual graph. We created a tile plot of the sample HRD calls by assay to visualize the level of agreement and to see if any patterns emerged. Um, in the plot, the assays are rows and the clinical samples are col columns. We've also included the percent HRD, which is how many groups called that sample HRD um, as a row on the bottom, and then BRCA1 or 2, whether the patient had mutated or wild type BRCA. For each assay, we also included information about whether the, fact whether the assay used various factors to determine HRD on the right side of the graph. So you can see the columns for GLOH, TI, TAI, LST, and then HRR, which is looking at HRR genes in addition to BRCA1 and BRCA2. The samples and assays were clustered by relatedness, and so we identified a BRCA cluster or patients that had a, a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, and the majority of groups identified the sample to be HRD. We also identified what we called a consequence cluster because we see that a lot of groups call the samples HRD, but we do not see BRCA1 or 2 mutations. Additionally, towards the top of the assay groupings, you'll see assay J and K only looked at HRR genes, and those groups did not call any of the samples um, HRD. And on the right side of the graph, uh, we largely see not HRD, and there's some variability in the output. So we did some survival analysis, and remember I mentioned earlier, all these patients went on to receive platinum treatment. We also had some that had maintenance, um, and we didn't have any uh, difference in the timing or the, you know, there wasn't, a, it's not a prospective study. We're looking in a real-world data set. And so we see that patients who have HRD, so in the consequences cluster and the BRCA cluster, um, trend towards having improved benefit over the patients who have not HRD for overall survival. 
Um, again, not statistically significant, but with our data set, we were interested to see that that trend is starting to appear. And so with that, for our conclusions, we see moderate level of agreement observed for HRD calls across the assays. The patient and sample characteristics do not account for the variability between assays, at least those that we assessed. And so re recommendations for assay development moving forward, um, it'd be helpful to identify the best approach for assays to report HRD to enhance consistency for um, patients and providers when they're making decisions based off the outputs from these tests. Align on expectations for analytical validation and consider approaches for developing a gold standard, including use of a reference material. And with that, I'd like to thank all of our project partners for um, participating in our working group and a special thanks to the NCI Biometric Research Program led by Dr. Lisa McShane, who, act, who did all of the statistical analyses and helped us develop the statistical analysis plan. University of Alabama Birmingham, who provided us with the, um, the samples that we shipped to everyone, especially Dr. Rebecca Arend. Um, the Molecular Characterization Lab at Frederick National Laboratory did the extractions for 90 samples and then shipped those to 17 different labs. Um, and our diagnos diagnostic developers who participated and volunteered to be part of this project we wouldn't have been able to do without you. And with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Alex Lazar, who's going to run our panel on this topic. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. You can applaud. She, 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 she earned the applause. Go ahead. I don't want to interrupt that. So, um, so I'm Alex Azar. I'm a pathologist at, at MD Anderson. Um, I've had the pleasure over the last uh, 15 years of working on multiple projects with, uh, with Friends of Cancer Research. And I'm going to briefly introduce the, the, the panel now. And I want to keep this brief. These are all remarkably accomplished people. But what they know and what they can tell you is more impressive than their titles. But I'll give you their titles anyway. All right. So first is uh, Rebecca Rent. Um, is an associate professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, um, Division of Diagnostic Oncology at, the, at their O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, next is uh, Douglas Laird, Executive Director of Translational Oncology at Pfizer. Next is uh, Lisa McShane, who was uh, briefly introduced earlier as, uh, as, the, um, as part of the project um, at the National Cancer Institute, and she is the Associate Director of the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis and Chief of the Biometric Research Program. Uh, next, we have um, representation uh, uh, from the FDA with uh, Anand Patak. Uh, he's a medical officer, Division of Molecular Genetics and Pathology in the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics, Center for Devices and Radiologic Health. Um, and last, but certainly not least, um, uh, Ethan Sokol, who's a principal scientist at Foundation Medicine. So. Um, uh, as, as I think Hillary mentioned, um, we've, we've got some, some sort of set questions that we're going to kind of go through, and then um, uh, when, we, when we get through those at the end, we'll be able to field questions, um, you know, from the audience and, and theoretically online questions as well. We'll see, we'll see, uh, we'll see how well we pull that off. So, um, so I'm going to, so I'm going to start, uh, start first with a, with a question for Douglas, and the, and the question there is, you know, in, in what ways are HRD assays being integrated into drug development? first question, and then, and then how are they shaping the development of new cancer therapies? Okay. Uh, thanks, Alex. So um, uh, par PARP inhibitors um, have been uh, proved for multiple cancer types, including uh, breast, prostate, uh, pancreatic, and ovarian. And um, in terms of uh, HRD uh, is associated with sensitivity to uh, PARP inhibitors in these indications, but also it should be said that um, HRD also appears to sensitize to other agents targeting DNA repair pathways, such as PAL theta inhibitors and ATR inhibitors, um, as examples. Um, and uh, in, terms, in terms of recent um, uh, pro progress in the field, one of the more exciting things has been the recent uh, approval based on magnitude, TALIFO2, and PROPEL trials of combinations of PARP inhibitors with um, uh, novel hormonal therapies. And w one thing that's really stood out from there is um, th 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 these approvals reflect in, um, to some extent, the uh, uh, f exploitable crosstalk between androgen receptor signaling and DNA repair pathways. Um, one thing that's emerged from this, though, is also the clinical and scientific and regulatory complexity around these approvals where uh, domestically and internationally, uh, different indications and different requirements or, or no lack of requirements for uh, HRD and mutational status. And so I think what this really shows is um, 
behooves us to really um, understand the HRD assays, what they're measuring, and also understand variability between the assays and causes of that. So I think uh, this is very timely. Oh, I think ovarian is a great space to tackle this, given um, ovarian is an indication, I think, with um, uniquely high levels of HRD and has been a long time sort of proving ground for, for th uh, these approaches. And um, uh, so uh, I think this was the, a great indication to choose for this work. Okay, um, uh, fa fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, and Becca, um, question for you. Um, how are HRD assays uh, currently infu uh, influencing our treatment decisions in clinical settings? Yeah, so thanks for that question. This has been an amazing experience, it really has. Um, I just have to say that. Um, we really are using HRD as standard of care in terms of who we test. Um, we test everybody for HRD in the upfront setting. Um, while there are PARP inhibitors that are approved for all comers, including HR proficient patients, patients who have HR deficiency um, have a much better um, outcome uh, and the degree of benefit um, is much higher in those patients. So there continues to be a debate about whether it's worth the toxicity in the HR proficient patients. Um, there are gonna be some HR proficient patients who would respond to PARP inhibitors and likewise, there's gonna be some HR deficient patients who do not respond to PARP inhibitors. You know. To date, BRCA is really the closest thing we, ha we have, and there's a lot of variability. Um, I think, you know, one of the fascinating things that has uh, just been amazing to be a part of this project is the landscape of the treatment with PARP inhibitors has really continued to evolve and change significantly over the past several years. Um, and that really further highlights the complexity of this space. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you very. Thank you very much. And Ethan, a question. Question for you. Um, you know, with with within our within our project that, that Hillary presented today, and more broadly, you know, there there's m clearly multiple ways of measuring and reporting HRD. Um, can you discuss the, the 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 types of approaches and with in some more detail and their implications? Sure. Yeah. So I wanted to start by stating the obvious. Uh, we, we've have almost 20 diagnostic developers in this harmonization consortium. It's just a sliver of all those who are developing tests. So this is a very busy space. And we've seen a large diversity of ways to measure HRD. Some uh, assay developers include GLOH, TAI, LST, AI algorithms, methylation, RNA. Uh, broadly, you can uh, kind of collapse that into kind of two things that are measured, uh, causes of HRD, so this would be measuring mutations or consequences typically by measuring genomic scars. And from the data we've seen, if you're only measuring the causes, you may miss a population of HRD patients by alternative uh, mechanisms. One other aspect to consider is the clinical context, so we have a mix of RUO assays and clinical use assays. Uh, it's important that the clinical use assays have uh, sufficient validation for uh, impacting decision making. Yeah, so, so, so given all, that, given all that, um, that variability in the ways that we're testing and looking at, at, at HRD, in some ways it's actually remarkable that we saw the degree of concordance that we have, because all of these tests are constructed very, very differently, very, very differently from each other. Um, Lisa, next, a question, a, a question for you. Um, regarding the statistical approach of our study, um, what are the limitations or considerations that we should be aware of when, as we're trying to interpret this data? Well, the first thing to remember is we don't have a gold standard here. Uh, we are comparing assays to one another. And even if we had a gold standard, we need to think about what is the right gold standard. So we have what I could think of as a biological gold standard. If we could magically say what we really meant by homologous recombination deficiency, that would be a biological gold standard. But obviously these tests all have different ways of assessing that. Um, another gold standard would be what I'd think of as a clinical gold standard. Who's gonna be platinum sensitive or, or perhaps even you know, more contemporary, who's gonna respond to PARP inhibitors? So uh, you know, I think what we were able to do here is give you a descriptive analysis that shows here's what we have. This is the level of concordance or discordance. And there were many exploratory analyses that were done. So if you're looking for a lot of p-values, uh, I'm not gonna give them to you. Uh, you know, this is just, here are the data and, and we need to learn from the data and think about what next steps would be. 
All right, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Ethan, another one, another one for you. Um, what criteria were used in the sample inclusion in our assay, and is this re really reflective of the typical clinical scenarios that we run across? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think we required that all of the samples have at least 70% tumor cellularity and high DNA quality metrics, which is not always representative of samples from the real world. So overall, we saw very few indeterminate samples, and I think that kind of high rate of pass was probably boosted by the really high quality of the samples. Overall, we saw moderate concordance, and I think an open question is whether we would see that same level of co concordance in lower quality samples. Yeah, so, so, that, so that was in fact, you know, part of the, part of the design of our, of our study to have high quality, you know, samples, you know, in that way to try to, try to limit, the, limit what would assume to be variability. And in clinical practice, um, unfortunately, we, we sometimes kind of redline what's, uh, you know, what's, what's allowed in terms of, you know, in, in order to try to get results for, you know, for patients in particular situations. Um, uh, an, Anand, a question for, a question for you. Um, is, there, is there any additional information about the assays that would have been ideal um, to have that we did not have? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say that it was a wonderful opportunity to participate in this group, and, you know, we had a lot of discussion. And, uh, you know, for, from the FDA's perspective, you know, you want, you know, robust analytical validity and clinical validity, and the additional information that we would have been good to have is, is something like clinical truth with outcomes with PARP inhibitors. Now, this type of clinical truth for assays is an important piece of information that we use in our re regulatory decision making. Also, as Ethan said, the samples selected for the study were very high tumor purity samples and had very high DNA quality, right? So for, from our perspective, we like to see the performance of, of these systems under more challenging conditions. So the assessment of um, the impact of tum low tumor content on the ability of these assays to make the same call would have been important. So it's for sort of a comparative assessment near the LOD of, of, of the system. Finally, uh, you know, I, I, I think it was said earlier that physicians assume that these assays are perfect, but even for you know, something like uh, picking up complex variants like large rearrangements, these assays are not perfect, and it would have been in, uh, very important to understand the ability of these assays to pick up these type of complex variants, especially at low DNA input. So ba basically, um, you know, challenging the system in terms of device performance and also getting a source of clinical validity would, would have been I ideal, actually, in a study design. Thanks. So, uh, so, so we're going to move now, sort of, into a, a series of questions where you where you saw from the data that that Hillary presented that there that there was some variability in terms of the results. And we're going to talk about what some of the drivers of that were. So, um, so I'm going to throw this first question out to both um, Ethan and Becca. Um, and uh, the, the question here is, were there any variables um, that, that we interrogated that served as positive or negative controls for association with HRD calls and concordance? Yeah, so uh, as Hillary showed, we uh, split our analyses into BRCA mutant and BRCA wild type uh, uh, subgroups. And the reason we did this is because we know that BRCA1 and 2 mutations are associated with HRD, especially in ovarian cancer. Uh, and as expected, we saw a higher rate of HRD positivity and higher PPA in that group. Uh, similarly, we know that uh, cyclin E1 amplifications are, tend to be mutually exclusive with HRD. So we looked specifically in the CCN E1 amplified subset and found that these had lower rates of HRD and higher NPAs. And so when you're designing kind of an analytical validation, it's important to include both positive and negative controls to make sure that everything is kind of working as expected. Yeah, and from the clinical piece, um, thanks for that. You know, as Hillary said, uh, the, first of all, the numbers are tiny. 
Um, so none of the clinical variables, you know, were positive or negative controls. So debulking status, even platinum sensitivity, survival, none of that um, was a predictor. Um, and so I think the genetic, you know, BRCA and CCNE1 being, you know, at least somewhat a predictor um, was nice to have. Um, and unfortunately, just the numbers didn't allow us to see anything in the clinical data in terms of predictability. And uh, thank you. And so, uh, Douglas, coming back to you, um, were the results regarding the tumor purity and DNA quality and, and sample age uh, surprising to you in any way? Yeah, uh, Alex, that's a great question. And the sort of um, my response to some point extends upon Anand's point about real world conditions. And I think there's a fantastic paper from a couple of years ago on clinical cancer research looking at the um, technical success rate for testing, uh, for HRD testing in uh, tumors from the profound phase three study. And this was uh, about 5,000 tumors from the all tested population. So it gives a real battlefield perspective, I thought, and very invaluable. And their um, relationships did emerge for, um, between um, sample age, uh, DNA quality, and uh, tumor purity were three parameters that jumped out as having a, a mild influence. Um, but I, I think, you know, as per the discussions earlier here, the, because there was um, a, a level of uh, pre-filtering and quality assessment in advance, it doesn't surprise me then that in, in, a, in a more carefully curated population that, we, that these factors uh, didn't jump out. Gotcha, thank, th thank you, thank you. And um, uh, Lisa, uh, back, back, back to you. Uh, we didn't really pre, uh, you know, define what level of alignment was going to be good enough, which, you know, ends up being a, you know, a matter of judgment. But what are some considerations when determining the level, uh, you know, what level of agreement is acceptable across assays? Okay, well, I think it's important to remember that none, no assay for HRD that I'm aware of perfectly predicts who's going to benefit um, or who's going to be sensitive to these therapies. Um, so with that in mind, we have to realize that even if two assays have a fair amount of disagreement, maybe they're picking up different parts of the population that are still going to be benefiting or not benefiting from PARP inhibitors or, you know, being sensitive to platinum agents. So, you know, I think we had some assays where the concordance was in the, you know, 30, 40 percent range. And, you know, that the initial reaction to that might have been, oh, my God, you know, but, but it's, we don't really know how to understand that concordance. And so that's kind of the reason that we didn't upfront say, got to meet 80 percent, 90 percent concordance, or this is all terrible. You know, we really don't know. We're, we really, what this has done, this exercise has, has said to us, there's a space here where we need to be investigating things more. What we ultimately want to know is, are there certain assays that do a better job predicting who's going to benefit from PARP inhibitors, who's going to be sensitive to platinum agents? Um, so that's really where we need to be focusing. And, and I you know, want to leave you with a really important thought. You know, often people feel like, well, my ass is better because I can identify more people who are HRD, therefore more people will have access to the drug. That is not the goal. The goal is to say, can we identify more accurately those who are going to benefit from these agents? All right, and uh, um, Anand, I'm going to throw you a tough one. <laughs> so knowing that variability exists, what can be done to ensure that assays are accurate and reliable? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say that Lisa's comments are like music to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, stick together. I, I, I think like, you know, you know, first thing, you know, a very practical, pragmatic approach to addressing the variability across assays would be to establish, you know, reference material, right? That can help establish analytical validity. But, you know, it's more complex because if you're highly concordant, you know, that may be a positive sign, right? But if you're discordant, you still ought to uh, you know, investigate the clinical performance of the device. And for the HRD space where, you know, different a HRD assays actually have different definitions of the HRD biomarker, clinical validation is actually critically needed to demonstrate that each assay is identifying the intended use population that actually benefits from the corresponding therapy. And the sort of 
to echo what Lisa said earlier, you know, from my perspective at least, assays can be discordant but still have similar clinical efficacy because the assays might be identifying slightly different populations that actually respond to the drug. And this is an important reason why clinical validation is actually very important for these uh, devices for complex biomarkers. So. Thanks. So, um, uh, so Ethan, w one of the one of the conclusions or thoughts with this would, th would be that it would be nice to have a set of you know um, of reference materials, you know, in order to tune these assays even going forward, similar to what we did in this project. So, what are the components of our data set that um, that, that would be helpful to have in such a reference data set, and, and what were we missing that we that, that could maybe be improved as we think about moving forward with that? Yeah. So there, there are a few things. I think the first is to make sure you have a good mix of BRCA wild type and BRCA mutant patients, which we did in this study. Uh, another aspect is to make sure that you have sufficient DNA, RNA, or other materials for a lot of labs. I think generally we got a very good yield from a lot of the specimens we collected. But if you want to truly make this a, a good reference standard, you know, hopefully it's enough for you know, 80, 100 labs so that everyone can be using kind of a, the same reference data set. I think one, one thing that we didn't necessarily have but would be good for a reference data set is a good real world representation. So some of these lower purity, uh, lower DNA quality samples. Uh, and I think the biggest thing would be sufficient number of samples with PARP inhibitor outcomes, allowing for statistical analyses. So we were we didn't have PARP inhibitor outcomes, and our samples were limiting even for uh, platinum uh, statistics. All right, um, thanks. So so in the uh, in the in the in the last few questions that we have here in the formal question part before we open up to um, to questions um, online and from the and from the audience. Um, we're going to sort of talk about, you know, where do, where do we go from here from what we've learned from what we've learned so far. So um, this one again is for both uh, Lisa and Becca. So based on our findings, what are the implications for the field and, and what recommendations can we extract from this data? Uh, well, uh, I, I think the big message is we have some more work to do. Uh, we, we need to understand. Uh, what these discordances mean? Are there tests that perform better than others? Um, you know, we're going to need help from the community. Uh, you know, th this group of panelists, you know, we're not going to be the ones who can take it the whole way to the end to answer that, you know, kind of final clinical question. Um, and, you know, I, I can tell you that patients live by these numbers. Um, yeah, some of you know I have a sister, my younger sister is an eight year survivor of advanced ovarian cancer. Um, and boy, every single test result she gets is she just hangs on to. And so, so we really, we owe this to our patients to, to get it right. Yeah, um, I love that. And I just want to chime in, you know, physicians and patients, we want consistency. We want to know that what the answer is, is going to be consistent across, you know, where we order the test. I think some really valuable things that we've heard is access to care. We want an assay that everybody can use. Um, one of the comments my fellow just presented this at Winter SGO was, "Oh, this you know gives me uh, you know this shows why I just give PARP inhibitors to everybody because it doesn't matter." But one of my passions is personalized medicine. We don't want to continue giving medication to everybody if some people are not going to respond and if some people are gonna be on PARP inhibitors and get secondary malignancies and go through the side effects of what that means to be in a PARP inhibitor when it may not be affecting your survival. We have to develop better assays. And as a clinical trialist, I urge all these diagnostic companies, the trials we've done usually only use one assay. So if we can incorporate multiple assays in these prospective trials where we do have hundreds or thousands of ovarian cancer patients, that's what we need. Um, and we have to remember that these assays that we're using now as HRD, you know, in the PARP studies, the sensitivity and specificity were 50 to 70% for PARPs, you know, 50 to 60% for platinum. So we, we have work, they're not perfect. Um, no biomarker is perfect, but until we're curing women with ovarian cancer and until we know who to treat with what, 
there's still a lot of work to be done in this field. Thanks. Um, so, so, the, so the next question is, um, is going to be uh, headed toward uh, Anand and Ethan. What do you feel are the key areas of research that need to be prioritized around the role of HRD and its use in drug development? Who do you want to go first? Which, which you guys can duke it out. <laughs> okay. Um, l l let me start by saying that, um, yeah, there's been a lot of change in the landscape of o ovarian cancer treatment with PARP inhibitors in the past few years. So there's clearly a need for a lot more research around the use of HRD in the clinical space. And I brainstormed what could be done to you know, help drug development and device development in, in the HRD space. And some important questions to think about for the future are one, first of all, one, how do you actually establish reference materials or reference methods, right? And secondly, do we actually need a more harmonized definition of HRD based on both causes and consequences, the genes included on HRD panels, et cetera? Please note that different assays are currently using, you know, very different definitions of HRD using different combinations of uh, T-bracket mutations, HRR gene mutations, LOH, LST, TAI. So that's one major question. Another question is actually more about, about the genes and the variants. So is more consensus needed between labs about the interpretation of variants in HRR genes and the significance of particular HRR genes for particular therapies in particular cancers, right? But you, you know, you need to t take a careful deep dive into that rather than lumping everything together. And another thing is that is more data needed on the clinical response to different HRR genes and variants. I mean, uh, there are some examples I, I, I can cite that where, I mean, you, cl cl you clearly would have been better off, you know, taking a more granular look at the response to particular genes, right? And finally, I, I have to end by saying that uh, one of the most important things is to figure out what are the critical components driving the HRD call that are most important for clinical response, right? Is it T BRCA? Is it GLOH? Is it GIS? Is it, what, what, what is it? Understanding these critical elements that drive response may actually ultimately help us harmonize HRD across assays and actually lead to better outcomes for patients. We really need to understand these critical components that drive clinical response. Additional studies looking at this question in a more granular way will be very helpful for drug and device development and for patient care. Great points. Um, so I, I'd like to add on to this that you know, while these sort of efforts of looking across 17 different developers are useful, one point of research I think that I'd like to add is around analytical and clinical validation. So you, you can look at you know, what is the agreement across tests, but each developer has the opportunity to undergo their own robust analytical validation. So when FMI analytically validated our test, we looked at limit of uh, detection, limit of blank, reproducibility, accuracy, the impact on interfering substances. These are all things that labs can, and in my opinion, should do uh, when they're looking at their tests. Uh, kind of in a, a, a different vein, but you know, a very important vein, uh, Clinical validation is key when a test starts to be used for clinical decision making rather than for research use. And in those cases, you know, oftentimes this will be you know, a phase three clinical trial that'll be the evidence that needed. But if you're kind of a new kid on the block, a new developer, that might take the form of extremely high concordance, maybe 95% you know, with the companion diagnostic laboratory. Yeah, so so you know, just a just as a further comment, I mean, the, I mean, the real the real complexity with all of, all of this is that um, we don't really know exactly what HRD is. We know that it's important biologically. We're not sure how to define it. 
We've got BRCA inhibitors. We understand somewhat, you know, um, uh, how the drug works, but not completely. Uh, you know, this HRD that we don't completely understand, we also don't know, um, you know, what's the best test for it. So lots and lots of areas of, of, un of uncertainty here. And so, you know, in some ways, you know, what we've been talking about is maybe the best thing we can do is try to, is try to tune, you know, what we do know, you know, to the, you know, to the outcomes in the clinical trial. And this is what, you know, this is what you were talking about, Becca. So to close out our, our formal part of the questioning, and I already see questions popping up on the, on the monitors up here. Um, we're going we're gonna to have you close this out, Douglas. Um, and, that's, and the question for you is, what emerging technologies or methodologies are you excited about or you believe will significantly impact the, the development and accuracy of HRD assays in the near future? Um, so, uh, and personally, and this isn't probably going to come as a revelation to people, but I think the rise of um, cdDNA-based uh, HRD testing, aka liquid biopsy, has been really, I think, um, exciting and important over the past uh, few years. And um, I think there, there's you know, pros and cons relative to the um, uh, solid tissue testing. So in terms of um, uh, pros, I think what you're getting with the um, uh, cdDNA testing is a real-time snapshot of current um, patient status. And but you're also by default sampling multiple tumor sites typically um, when you're getting uh, cdDNA. Um, I think uh, in terms of cons, and it, it's a um, c couple of things come to mind. One is um, lower sensitivity against copy number loss, which is you know particularly important for um, BRCA2, where copy number loss, uh, large deletions, is often associated with um, poor outcomes, but also sensitivity to PARP inhibition. And um, the other thing I think is just that um, the potential for false positives for several genes in uh, HRR panels, um, particularly uh, CHECK2, I think this is probably emerging as, as the major problem, and simply because of uh, clonal hematopoiesis of a known origin, um, hard to distinguish low, uh, low variant to low frequency of that from an uh, authentic tumor mutation. And I think that doesn't reflect um, you know, a failure or technical flaw, it's just an intrinsic biological complexity um, uh, associated with that. Um, I, it, but I will say, given even those caveats, that there have been a couple of um, recent uh, presented efforts to look at alignment of results between liquid and solid. And so this was done in an apples to apples fashion for the Propel study, and then separately for Talapro 2, looking at um, Foundation 1 um, uh, versus Foundation 1 liquid results. And where patients were valuable or had an informative result for both tests, there was about 85% agreement for HRR mutational status at the level of just one or more mutations from a small panel, which I think was honestly about as good as could reasonably expected given the differences in time and space. Um, so that was very, very encouraging about the sort of um, the pseudo similarity and results and recognizing that the tests are t to a large extent complementary, not meant to necessarily re replace each other. Um, other things that are, I think, pretty exciting are people are really starting to apply uh, machine learning, you know, based approaches and so on to come up with uh, new HRD signals, signatures, maybe in a more agnostic fashion and uh, hopefully pulling in clinical data. Um, and lastly, and this actually gets to the question that just came, came through on the screen here as well, is um, a functional test like RAD51 uh, status where you're really measuring a consequence uh, see, seem, seem very exciting to me and are scientifically appealing. Uh, I think um, the main challenge there is obviously we, we, the science is great and just need to see more um, analytical and clinical validation of those. Okay, well, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And so, so this, so this is sort of we've, we're kind of closing out the you know the formal questions now. We have an online question which um, which Doug has uh, started to address, but we'll dig into that a little bit more. So there are mics set up um, to ask questions. We ask you to remember that a question is a question and not a statement. <laughs> we have strategically placed 
um, both uh, Jeff and Hillary very close to the mics, and they, they are trained in whatever kind of art is necessary to make sure that your question is a question. Um, and uh, I'm not responsible to what happens if you, if you choose not to follow those guidelines. So, um, so, so while we're waiting, I see that we have, we have a, you know, one person ready to come up. I'm going to take this online, um, this online question because this actually appears to be working at the moment, which I think is remarkable. Um, and so let's do this. So this is from, and I am so sorry online if I, if I butcher your name, but um, this is from um, Surat uh, Durabi. Um, and... Uh, you know, do we, ha do we have any updates on RAD51 as a functional biomarker, which Douglas started to address, and what would be the pros and cons of using something like a RAD51 functional test as a, as a gold standard? And, um, you, you know, maybe you would like to dig into that a little bit more, and then maybe I'll throw it down to, to Ethan as well. Okay, I think, I mean, the, the pro to me is just the scientific um, directness of the question. You're really looking at tissue status. Um, the, the cons are it's... Um, uh, uh, um, T tissue-based test and obviously not a, n not not applicable to liquid testing uh, as yet. Um, I, I will say that um, you know just following the field from a distance, just from the literature, there seems to have been progress made in terms of um, ruggedness of the test and ability to pr use um, FFP samples as opposed to fresh. Is my understanding from the literature, which is a huge breakthrough there, I think. Um, and uh, I know the folks at Val LeBron, for example, have been real pioneers in pushing this. Just I haven't seen. The next steps of where it's maybe implemented in a ideally uh, as an exploratory antibody, maybe even in a phase three trial. Because one of the things that jumps out of here and talking about relationship of clinical outcome um, to the HRD status is we know for a good example would be CDK12, where with PARP monotherapy, there's lots of good literature showing minimal benefit to those patients. But when you got to the phase three setting in MCRPC, that you could see. Um, um, the um, PARP inhibitor combination arms, uh, beating control arms, uh, just that you, you're trying to distinguish the um, uh, efficacy from the innately poor prognosis in that case. So I think just getting those data together will be uh, interesting, but certainly um, bears watching. Sure. You not, not too much to add to that, but I would really like to echo your point of kind of the ease of cl clinical implementation. So I think unless these get to FFPE and show the kind of high quality performance specs, I think it can be challenging. There are some uh, aspects of, you know, an all-in-one test that's measuring, you know, not just HRD, but it, there is something very nice about a more direct measurement than uh, looking at something kind of more peripheral like scarring, which is permanent and uh, will not be, you know, changing as you become PARP insensitive. Can I make one comment? You absolutely yeah. may. Um, I agree with everything that's been said, and I think that I just want to take this opportunity to say, you know, and echo what I've said before, but others have said is, you know, when designing clinical trials, um, I think it's important, and I and I say this, you know, as the co-leader in uh, ovarian committee translational science, and I say, well, you have to have an integrated biomarker so that you know the NCI will actually pay for the biopsies to be stored. Um, because you can't even apply for an exploratory biomarker until the readout is done. But I urge everybody to go into Navigator or discuss it with the pharma companies of implementing these as exploratory biomarkers in these large trials. And I do think that historically our HRD is a scar. Um, it's a consequence and we need to have more real-time functional assays and RAD51 seems to be promising um, in the preliminary data, but again, that's still archival FFPE. So what can we do in real time? And I do think CTDNA um, is going to be the wave of the future. There's lots to be done, and I just gave a talk at Winter SGO on that topic, <laughs> and you know, urging people to really you know, integrate these things into the clinical trial design from the get-go. All right, so um, we're gonna go here first because I saw you first. We'll go here second because I saw you second. So, um, uh, so, with your, so as you start your question, just um, please provide us with your name and affiliation. Sure. Thank you so much. My name is Sid Mathur. I'm from Merck. So I think the <clears throat> panel discussed the importance of clinical validation. So my question is to Dr. Patak at FDA. Um, this is slightly off topic and maybe future looking. But with the recently proposed down regulation of CD access to class twos, um, how might the validation requirements for complex tests like companion diagnostic, like uh, HRD change? Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, we just got the announcement that they're initiating 
that program right yesterday. So basically, if they, they do become deep, uh, down classified, uh, the special controls need to mitigate the risks of the test, right? So I, I think at this point, we haven't had the discussion yet about what these special controls would mean in terms of clinical validity. That being said, even for de novos or 510Ks, we do expect some form of clinical validity. I, I hope that answers your question. And uh, may, maybe those involved with our pol policy team could better address that question. And, and there you go, the, everything you need to know about a complex <laughs> regulatory framework that was just announced yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, yes, ma'am. Thanks. Um, Sue Anna Brunigi from um, ASCO. Uh, great panel and fabulous work. Um, I actually wanted to go back to a question that Dr. Aaron asked. Um, why do we only do one test in these trials? Um, and the reason I'm asking it is actually what Dr. McShane said about having a sister with ovarian cancer. Fabulous that she's with us for so long. I also have a brother-in-law who has stage four pancreatic cancer. Um, just diagnosed, so just starting treatment, but patients do watch these numbers. And in um, the ICI space, we have the problem of PDL1, and now we have HRD. So why only one test? Go ahead. Please, J just, just a, qu um, a quick comment there. I think it's, it's, um, they're obviously related tests, but for example, in, um, in, in some of the phase three trials, you can enroll based on the positive result from you know, more than one test. So, uh, for example, in our ongoing uh, Talapro 3 trial, patients couldn't um, have solid tissue and blood both tested for Foundation 1. So, you know, same, same test, if you like, but two different matrices, or similar tests with two different matrices. But I think in that case, a positive result from either test was sufficient to enroll the patient. So I, I totally, I think for flexibility as much as anything else and recognizing the age of the diagnostic, um, you know, tissue block. I think there's t that's a kind of tactical way to address that. But I think that's, um, that in practice, that seems to work pretty well, especially because the agreement's been pretty good. And, you know, I'll make a comment. This is one of the things that I absolutely loved about this project um, is that it, it was agnostic. Um, I've always said that, you know, it doesn't matter. It's not one pharma, it's not one diagnostic. Um, and I think a lot of that is driven by, you know, collaborations between pharma and one diagnostic and wanting a companion diagnostic and, you know, the, the you know, looking for what's going to be approved, all of that. Um, the NCI, it's about cost. Um, and I'm going to shoot myself in the foot for saying this, but I urge you to reach out to me because one of the spaces that, you know, we do have the opportunity to do this is in investigator-initiated trials. Um, and so one of my investigator-initiated trials is looking at um, using mervatuximab in alpha-folate receptor positive patients in the upfront setting. So those patients are all required to give tissue and it's all neoadjuvant. So they're getting two tissue time points and they're all getting blood collected it's at multiple sites. So if you're interested in you know, being an exploratory biomarker as I continue that, um, that's my passion um, and I'm happy to work with anybody. On, yeah. on that. I want to expand on one of Doug's comments and the issue of trial design and incorporating multiple biomarkers. So many of our trial designs, especially for targeted therapies, are done in what we call enriched populations. So yeah, it'd be wonderful. I am totally on board. I'd love to look at 10, 20 different assays. But, but if you're going to enrich the trial population, does that mean that if you're positive on any one of them, you get onto the trial? And you know, how, what are the criteria for deciding which assays might have enough background data supporting them that we want to put all those people on the trial? It's, it's something we really struggle with. And you know, from a statistical perspective, just purely statistical, you know, you'd love to take all comers and then figure it out after the fact. But you know, we know that's not ethically acceptable in a lot of situations. So it's, it's really tough. I, I totally agree. You know, I wish the NCAI had deep enough pockets they could fund as much tissue collection, as many assays as possible, uh, but that's not what the reality is. So we, we have to um, make sure that we are keeping open minds about how many different assays could be evaluated. And we need to insist that the background data supplied for the assays who want to play um, is is rigorous. Uh, you know, we, 
There are millions of assays people propose to us all the time. And so how do we decide which ones get the priority for inclusion in a trial and you know, potentially getting funding for doing the assay work? I, I want to add one other point, which is a lot of times tissue material is extremely limiting in the context of clinical trials, especially when you're trying to get a, you know, a post-progression biopsy where it may be extremely limiting and you may only have the material to run it on one assay. And so if half of them can only be run on one and then 30% can be run on two and 10% you know, can be run on three, it makes the statistics very difficult when you're talking about a subset of a subset. And I just want to add, the, you know, the whole possibility of getting a biopsy when you have a patient sitting in front of you who has progressed on therapy, that's a tough conversation. And historically, our ability to get those samples is not very good. I will say that, that that's changing. Um, I will say that it's becoming more and more common for um, you know, and even even women who you know have accessible tumors and after cycle one to really be able to look at these exploratory things, um, I think historically, absolutely, it's hard. Um, but my experience has been, you know, when I sort of explain that the importance of moving the field forward and the science behind it, um, you know, another one of my uh, projects is looking at you know progression after PARP, and those women get you know, CT guided biopsies to make PDX models to figure out some of the causes of that. And people are more receptive to it than I originally thought. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we need to keep having those conversations yeah. so patients do understand what's involved in getting a biopsy, why it might be helpful. But, uh, you know, again, it, the broad experience yeah. has not been as positive as what you, you've been able to do. And kudos to you for being able to, you know, get those samples. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of second second best, but obviously again with CTDNA, at least there's possibility, mm -hmm. and we've yep. learned a lot about a mechanisms of acquired resistance, right. um, and consequently how do drugs were working in the first place That's by right. looking at uh, end of treatment um, biopsies. Agree. You know the circulating tests definitely you know, we get them in more involved in some of these studies. I think it would be great. So, so that, that, was a, that was a great question. I think you engaged nearly every member of the panel. <laughs> so congratulations on that. So in the waning few minutes, let's have a couple of, um, of quick questions and quick answers. We'll start over here. Yeah, Carl Barrett, uh, University of North Carolina, but formerly AstraZeneca. You know, having spent 12 years developing a lab in five different indications and working with foundation and other uh, companies to develop the diagnostics, I fully appreciate what you did here. So I give you congratulations. Uh, my view of the HRD, I'm not surprised that the assays are not perfectly coordinated because I, I look at it as the HRD is, are the known unknown causes of uh, genetic instability. So my question is, have you looked at uh, some of the AI uh, measures of variants of unknown significance which seem to be better? Have you looked at some of the other you know, DNA repair genes that are on the, on the uh, foundation panel in this data set? And have you thought, do you have samples to do whole genome sequencing or methylation to look for other known causes? Um, well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab. I'll take a stab at that. So, so, that, so those are all great things that we could do, Carl, and thank you for your, thank you for your question. Sorry I didn't recognize you. The, the light was in my eyes. <laughs> um, and um, the, um, but we, but we, so, we, sort of, we sort of kept pretty closely to what the initial study you know, set was coming out to this, and Hillary's, gonna, and Hillary's gonna come up and address this as well, which was a comparison of the assays you know, as they were run and developed to sort of compare them and not really try to get, not really try to understand how the assays were, were working necessarily by doing further work, but being able to compare them directly to each other you know, as they were being run in the wild. But Hillary, I'll let you take a stab yeah, at that so also. Yeah, so we do have some genetic information, um, genomic information from the patient samples. We asked the developers when they were running their assays if they could also tell us whether 14 genes, it's the 14 that are most commonly used for HRD, um, had any alterations. And so we have some data about variants of unknown significance. The problem is that 17 different developers gave us that information, and then distilling it down on top of all the other work that we've presented today has been a little bit of a challenge. So we are taking a little bit of a look on that, so keep an eye out for our manuscript. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, you, know, you also run into statistical boundaries, right? I mean, we started with 90 sets of uh, 90 patients for whom we had data across the assays, and so now you start looking at a particular gene in the HRR 
pathway, and maybe you're down to three patients who had that particular mutation. So it, yes, w I think we still do plan to look at that descriptively, but again, the power to really draw conclusions will be limited in this particular study. Well, nevertheless, I think it highlights my concern about the variant interpretation, especially for missense variants. I mean, you can often have erroneous interpretation of you know, variants like missense variants. And our, and our final question. Can I get one word in? I'm representing the prostate world where we have a big question as to whether or not patients have to have a alteration in the HRD pathway using with hormones because there is some mechanistic. The question is, could this tr trial be done in reverse where you look at, get a group of specimens of patients who are pretty much along the same point of their you know, of their journeys, not having seen 42 different drugs versus, let's say, first or second line, and just test the assays against the responders and see how those perform based on a retrospective study, mm -hmm. which might help in reverse, because the diversity of the populations on the trials is enormous. And we celebrate when we see an, a DDR alteration because it's a drug that has an association in a disease where we don't have many mutations. I love that idea. Yeah, um, you know, running the trial, and again, that could be an exploratory biomarker. Once you have the data, let's take the, the, use the responders, let's put those together, and then just try to come up with some concordance amongst those that we know responded. I think that's a beautiful idea. Yeah. No, and we, you know, many of our stored specimens from our trials are used in that, yeah. that kind of fashion, and you can do retrospective studies. You know, where you run into the difficulties is with trials that have enriched based on a particular biomarker. Then you're looking at a specialized population. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I But you also need more than 90 patients. You also, oh yeah, way more than 90 patients. So then, you know, are there trials you can combine across trials to come up with the numbers that you would need to say something? Well, you can do this analysis called the sensitivity for responders analysis, right? Like what proportion of the responders your assay picks up to, to actually look at that question. You're and and comparing the assay. Yeah. And and then that then that music there, that's kinda like Academy Award time where you know, <laughs> the, the, next, the next thing is the you know, the shepherd's crook comes out and we're so so the, my most important uh, you know uh, responsibility here is to get us off the stage in about thirty seconds. So let's let's do it. Thank you very much, friends, for supporting this project. We really learned a lot. Very well done. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, and thank you all. Uh, for participating in the projects and for your thoughts today. Um, we are now going to take a quick 10 minute break. Um, so for those of you that are online, please stay online or rejoin us at 1145. For those of you in the room, we ask that you be in your seats by then for our next session. Thank you. And for uh, the next session, for those panelists, if you wouldn't mind migrating to the back of the room for uh, to get your microphones.
Okay. I think uh, the, the chimes will begin ringing outside, so we'll go ahead and get started while uh, people start to uh, take their seats in preparation of our next session. Uh, so to start, um, I will uh, go ahead and invite our, our next panel to join us on stage. Um, I'm particularly excited uh, by the work that the members of the, this next panel have been helping to lead. Um, last, several, last summer, several of you may have uh, attended a virtual meeting that we hosted outlining the potential of a digital pathology uh, project, looking at tools, uh, lo looking at how these types of tools can be implicated into the future of drug discovery. Um, and what we're, what we're here to talk about today is how that, progress, how that project has been progressing. So come on up um, to our next panel. Um, the advancement of these digital pathology technologies hold the potential to propel the next generation of cancer therapies, including things like uh, new treatments or antibody drug conjugates that are designed to carry a potent anti-cancer payload to specific molecular targets. Based on our past biomarker harmonization projects, as you heard in the last session, we recognize that the design of these digital pathology tools can be quite different. Uh, so to help validate their use and optimize the implementation in cancer research, an innovative framework demonstrating performance metrics is needed. So today, to help inform that process, we are very excited to announce the launch of a new partnership, the Digital and Computational Pathology Harmonization Project. This new DigPath research partnership is the output <coughs> of an expert working group that has been crafting the approach for the last couple of months, and we're thrilled that many of them are here today, including our next panel. So I am pleased to turn things over to Dr. George Green, who will serve as the moderator of our next session and help describe the role of digital pathology tools in drug development and provide insights and additional details to this new partnership. George? Thanks, Jeff. And uh, thanks to uh, Jeff, Alan, and the uh, Friends of Cancer Research Organization for us to have the opportunity to have this discussion. I think this is a fairly new conversation for Friends of Cancer Research. I, you know, a number of us um, have been on calls since summer, um, and hopefully everybody had a chance to either look at the white paper or read the introductory uh, um, handout that they had as meeting, but digital pathology is a rapidly emerging field with tremendous potential, and I think as a group we all recognize that, but we also recognize some of the challenges that uh, come with that, and um, hence this, this team that's been brought together by friends to start to address some of those challenges. Um, I think digital pathology today is in a similar place as maybe next generation sequencing was a decade or a decade and a half ago where everybody sees tremendous potential, there's a huge amount of information in there and it all needs to be coalesced into something that actually can help manage patient outcomes and help the field grow. Um, you know, it, it's, there's complex data we need to work with. There's many different applications, many different indications where it can be applied. It can be applied in everywhere from early research all the way up to, you know, patient management and beyond. And there's still many, many platforms out there that can be used. And all that's a good thing for, for the field, um, but it comes with the complexities of many variables. It comes with complexities of um, you know, uncertainty around the performance and the ap these applications. Um, there is a very significant difference in my mind with digital pathology, which is, and as with the HRD program that was uh, so, um, you know, it was a very interesting discussion prior, there is no gold ground truth in pathology. Ground truth is pathologists. Um, and there's, you know, there is many differences in both, you know, their opinions, their, their abilities, and their, you know, how they're trained and how they apply these things. And many of them, it's based on a lifetime of experience. And what we're trying to do here with digital pathology is take that lifetime ex of experience and condense it into a computer program. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's unique. Um, we don't have the you know, luxury of saying KRAS positive or KRAS negative. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so I think you know, in recognition of that, you know, friends brought together this team to, to approach some of these variables. Um, and, and I was on the early calls, and what was very apparent in those early calls was there was a, you know, a, a, just a huge variety of variables, and, and overwhelmingly so. And so what came out of those early calls was a commitment to a pilot program where we bit off a piece that was 
a reasonable size to chew, that we could actually come up with meaningful objectives and measurable outcomes from that that we believed we could accomplish within this pilot program to set up likely future evaluations and future approaches to build out, um, to, to build out the uh, digital pathology space. So I think <clears throat> if, for people who had the opportunity to read the white paper, it laid out, there's a nice table in the beginning that lays out multiple areas of digital pathology where digital pathology applications are growing and evolving. This focuses on the area of patient management, of looking at slides to make a decision around how to make a patient treatment. Um, and the, um, the group decided to focus in the HER2 space. It's been in, you know, it's been in the field for a long time. Um, it's been, there are many drugs, many patients treated with those drugs these days, and obviously accessibility to results, to uh, samples and other, uh, other information um, around those enabled us to set up a study like this. Um, so it's a similar principle as what's being done for the, uh, pr for the HRD program and for previous, previously the TMB program and other ones like that where we're bringing together academia, the regulatory um, teams, pharma, and the uh, diagnostic industry to look at the, uh, the, the applications of digital pathology in the context for now of HER2 and interpretation of HER2 slides. Um, so with that, I'll introduce the panel. Um, myself, uh, I am a uh, former pharmaceutical and diagnostics developer, currently uh, supposedly semi-retired, and that's not going so well. Um, but uh, consulting to the biotechnology and diagnostics industry and having a great time at it. Um, uh, working uh, immediately to my left here, so Siraj Ali is, the, is a physician scientist who is currently leading translational medicine at Lunit in Incorporated. Um, next is Brandon Gallus um, with CDRH. Um, he is a research mathematical statistician in the Division of Imaging, Diagnostics, and Software Reliability at the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories in CDRH. That's quite the title. Um, DJ Jawani is at Frederick National Laboratory um, for Cancer, uh, I'm sorry, Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Research, in which he's a director of pathology. Um, John Longshore is a um, former pathologist, uh, head of a pathology lab, but now is with, uh, he's the head of scientific affairs and global oncology diagnostics at AstraZeneca. And finally, um, Sarbisa Mukapati is uh, the founder and chief scientific officer at 4D Path Incorporated. All right. So I think, so we don't have any data to talk about today. This, the intent today is to inform, the, inform everybody about what the plans are for this and uh, lay out some of the challenges and ideas that uh, have, been, have come up over the last several months. So first, let's just set the stage for the project. So um, perhaps, um, uh, I'm sorry, let me just. So um, let's talk a little bit why about why this effort is needed. Um, I've laid out some of my thoughts, but I'd like to hear some uh, thoughts from the rest of the panel. So um, maybe John, given your perspective, both a, uh, from the lab and from the pharmaceutical company's uh, perspective, you could lay out your thoughts. Thanks, George. I think computational pathology is very exciting. It's certainly a quantum leap in the type of technologies that are uh, available to the practicing pathologist. And I think it's most exciting because we're moving beyond the capabilities of the human eye to uh, things that can't be accurately dis, um, ascertained with, with human eye and require some type of digital imaging. So in the last few years, we've seen the field progress from a binary read to a semi-quantitative read. Now we're getting into truly quantitative measurement of immunohistochemistry. So it's very exciting uh, for a pathologist to be able to have increased accuracy and precision for, for what they've been doing because this will certainly help drive improved patient identification. One of the nice things that you see with standardization and harmonization is the ability to accurately detect patients globally. A biomarker test result performed on the same sample should have the same result for a patient in Washington, D.C., in Boise, in Paris, or even Beijing. And that's one thing we'd like to see with standardization and harmonization, because that's what drives personalized therapy. Um, the impacts this will have on the field are massive. It impacts uh, translational research, biomarker discovery, uh, registrational studies that will be done for uh, companion diagnostics, whatever that may be, as we've heard in the future uh, today. 
uh, as well as clinical laboratory testing. So it's very exciting. But everyone wins with this. Oncologists win getting the right drug to the right patient. Pathologists have increased accuracy and precision of their results. Payers win because they have increased resource utilization and more accurate resource utilization. And most importantly, patients benefit because of the improved clinical outcomes you see. Certainly, we have to realize that these things don't exist in a vacuum and there's some, some gaps that we need to address. First and foremost, we need a regulatory framework to be developed for computational pathology. We need to know what type of data needs to be collected for um, translational research projects. We need to know what type of metrics are appropriate uh, for a computational pathology algorithm. And perhaps most importantly, we have a huge opportunity uh, or a huge problem with access. This is great technology, but we don't see the fruits of our labors if we don't find a way to commercialize this technology and get it into every pathology lab around the world. Thanks, John. So, so DJ, as a pathologist, do you see this as a, uh, a, a, a challenge or a, a, a benefit to you? Well, uh, it's a benefit that currently comes with challenges. And I think our uh, project is geared towards addressing some of those challenges. And, and one of the challenges, there are many, many platforms that are commercially available to be utilized in digital space. Uh, the question is, each of these defines uh, and quantitate biomarker differently, as well as how they translate the uh, information on the glass slide into its digital form. So there are many variables, and, and it will be critical from a pathologist's perspective to understand how each of these variables impact or could impact the, the interpretation they're going to otherwise provide using traditional microscopy. So, so that's one of the challenges. The other challenge would be most of this, if not all, uh, digital pathology platform needs uh, testing and validation samples uh, or gold standard uh, which doesn't exist and and uh, that would be then if there are no reference methods to calibrate all these different platforms uh, how does this variable impact again the patient's interpretation thank you so so brandon so actually jeff shuren mentioned a couple of examples of digital products that have already made their way through uh, FDA, but what are your thoughts on how this uh, effort uh, can support those? So I, I mean, more specific to computational pathology, of course, um, you know, I'm not sure there's a need for new frameworks, but there's definitely a need for examples or uh, understanding of the expectations of, of what needs to, to fit into a submission. And, uh, you know, there's so many variables to be concerned about uh, when you have every lab's recipe for creating slides is a little bit different. There's lots of different stains. There's different ways of putting all that together. And then you got to throw the scanner into that. And, uh, and then everybody will have concerns about subpopulations and populations that should be studied. And so to really work through some of those issues to understand which of those parameters really play a role in impacting the final uh, diagnostic result is, is would help the FDA understand what we should be asking for. Um, and so, you know, I'm thinking about data sets, you know, how big, how, how many, and, and, and all the different subpopulations and, and reproducibility studies do we need. And hearing from the, the, this, this working group that has so many uh, experts in the clinical space and in the computational space will really help us to understand some of those uh, needs. Um, but I think another big bonus could be that this group really kind of helps to standardize how it shows up when it comes to the submission. Uh, I don't know how, if you can imagine my review task when I have to read a submission and the different language I read every time, I have to get into the heads of the people that wrote these submissions. And, and every time they talk about a new data set and, and, and partitioning that data set for the different uses is using completely different structures and, and language. It, it takes me so much effort just to get the gist of what's going on and the details of, uh, of the patient population and things like that, that more standardization can help me do my job so much faster, I believe. Um, and, um, 
especially when it comes to the different ways that uh, AI is being used to support the pathologist. You know, everybody's got a very creative idea of how to, how to show that information and how it, it uh, uh, the different ways that it can impact the patient management. And if we can start grouping some of those so that we can uh, treat this group one way and have certain expectations, call, and even calling these certain um, uses uh, with certain labels, uh, in my experience in the radiology space, it's really ha helped to, to, you know, we have detections and we have classifications and we have quantitative uh, outputs. Um, all those things to, to more standardize and give net labels is not just an exercise in naming, but it really helps us understand what we should be getting in the review space. That's my thought about what I'm hoping to get out of this. No, thanks, Brandon. And uh, you know, as an assay developer, it's never good to have FDA in your head. Um, <laughs> we want to do it right, and so you don't have to go there, right? So it'll help and, everybody. Yeah. So and um, so maybe Siraj, you can talk a little bit from a developer's perspective about you know your thoughts on the pilot. Maybe maybe then move into some of the factors that we were considering. Um, with this program. That's right. Um, first of all, I do got to take one second on behalf of the panelists and the pilot working group to thank Brittany McKelvey from Friends. Uh, Couldn't be here point. today, but is really the driving force. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, look, uh, I think the word challenges was mentioned several times, John mentioning the opportunity. And from a developer perspective, we need standardization to get by these challenges. You know, I'll give you one small example. When we think about clinical study designs for validation, are we outputting ASCO CAP HER2 scoring, which is ordinal buckets, zero, one, two, three, or continuous scoring? You know, I'm not passing judgment, but what are we outputting from the clinical study design that would feed into validation and then feed into regulatory submissions and a regulatory pathway, right? I, that standardization is really necessary from a developer point of view to make our efforts efficient so we can go towards developing a product that gets out to patients as fast as possible. You know, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Sabisa, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think in this space, uh, when you are a developer, clearly working with FDA closely and clinicians closely gives a path that uh, converges. And uh, for the assay development and validation, there are different clinical standards of care. Just like Sh Shiraz mentioned, zero, one, two, three. There are other uh, clinical standards of care where you combine IHC plus FISH, that you uh, use IHC and take IHC2 and then do FISH amplified for versus non-amplified. That's a valid standard of care. Other standard of care could be FISH only. And eventually, whatever these, uh, any of these algorithms are outputting, that should align with the heart to driven tumor biology. Then only will be safe. It should align. Uh, these, uh, d these algorithms can come from different classes of development. Maybe they won't all fit in one class of development so that Brandon owned, I, I guess, owned, you won't review one type of application, but broadly they could be grouped into different classes of development, I will discuss factors and algorithm attributes. But overall, I also think that suddenly outputting the, um, the continuous and dichotomous or trichotomous, uh, whatever uh, way you are partitioning data to uh, compare with standard of care, various standard of cares, that, that's label of the device inclusion exclusion criteria. But also eventually, because of tumor heterogeneity and because of uh, clinical importance, if we could also compare with eventually with new adjuvant heart to targeted therapy response, then all of these algorithms will be unified towards a heart to gradation of negative to positive that is clinically significant. That could be a safe way to do that, and also in context of ADC and uh, tumor response therapy response that will be useful. So I'll stop here. Thank you. So. So, so I mentioned early in my introduction that this is a you know, complex problem to uh, approach. Yes. And so maybe, uh, um, Siraj, you could just talk a little bit about the, some of the factors that were considered in developing the pilot, um, and, and maybe just some that maybe weren't. Sure, sure. Um, I think, look, I'll go back to one of the frameworks that many of us were taught. There's pre-analytic, analytic, post-analytic. Post I think a little bit of a nuance here, particularly for this HER2 pilot project, is Analytic encompasses really both IHC and AI. 
you know, the AI algorithms. Obviously, the goal of the pilot, as stated in the handout, is to be comparing the AI algorithms, um, their performance. So we're looking to standardize the pre-analytic factors as well as the IHC analytic factors. Uh, I can say, you know, these factors are relatively controlled, whether it's processing, fixation, immunostain. We are getting specimens from a single institution. Sorry, it's not UAB, unlike the HRD <laughs> project. But, um, you know, that relatively, again, the phrase relatively controls the input so we can focus on comparing the uh, AI algorithms. And, you know, there is one other class of factors. These are sort of intrinsic. There are the, there's the intrinsic factors to the patient, the clinical variability, you know, age, gender, um, you know, tumor characteristics, is this a primary or is it metastatic, biopsy resection, that can be handled through subgroup analysis. But all of these, you know, control what we can extrinsically and then account for the intrinsic variation in subgroup analysis. So, Sarbisa, what about the algorithms? Yeah. Yeah, so the algorithms are of diverse species here. So one has to look into that whether they were the scope and the intended use, whether they were developed to scoring IHC or they were developed, like I said, IHC plus fish or fish only. Then comes that the, every algorithm starts from identifying the region of interest. What algorithm was used to identify region of interest? Was it another AI algorithm? Was it pathologist, AI plus pathologist? Was it a fixed rule-based uh, image analysis or other criteria-based um, um, algorithm that identified that initial area, then the algorithms themselves, then how you will output that based on this criteria. So a lot goes in that. And on top of that, to complicate things further, there is the um, scanner types and scanner formats, um, then also the magnification, base magnification, and then if the algorithms use multiple magnifications as well, just like um, pathologies uh, zoom in and zoom out, you could use multiple, multiple magnification pages. Mm -hmm. So a lot goes in there. And I think in this project, initially we won't be able to do all of them, but we'll start with some relevant and then we'll analyze which factors can destabilize the algorithms. Oh, thanks, yeah. And, and so one of the, I, I mean, maybe the third rail of this conversation is, uh, is what is uh, the, the ground truth that we're going to reference, and we probably could have spent the entire discussion doing that. But John, I'm going to ask you to just sure. try to cover that for us. Th thanks for giving me such a simplistic uh, yeah. topic. <laughs> uh, ground truth is not something that we really are trying to ascertain, at least in, in the pilot. Hopefully we will do that uh, in, in additional arms of, of the study. But it's really a challenge uh, to determine a ground truth, uh, truth for computational pathology because there is no orthogonal method. Uh, do you go with pathologist concordance? Do you go with a group of expert pathologists that are sitting around a multi-head scope to try to score something? All of the metrics we have for comparison are perfectly imperfect, as I would like to say. So establishing the ground truth will be something that is not part of the pilot, but that we will work on hopefully in future arms. We are fortunate that all of the samples came from a single center with a single group of pathologists reviewing them for the pilot, so that will, will be helpful. The second big gap that I think that uh, we have that's been addressed by several of the panelists as well are pre-analytics. For the pilot phase of the project, we are starting with whole slide images. So that completely takes out of the scope of the project looking at something as simple as uh, fixation, immunohistochemistry staining, what antibody clone was used, uh, what type of scanner was used, what type of image management system, uh, the list is endless. So understanding those pre-analytic factors, which I expect to be a huge source of variation for computational pathology, is something we will capture as a future aim in, in parts of the project, but outside the scope of the pilot. And that's how we harmonize and standardize, is understanding yeah. where the variability comes from. DJ, so, maybe, do you want to expand on that a little bit, or do you have some additional thoughts? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think John covered it pretty well. The only other thing that I'll add is, uh, uh, again, looking at several different factors, including the biopsies and, and resection, would be very, very critical, as well as 
the, the specimens from uh, the primary tumor versus the metastasis. Uh, we know there are differences exist in mm -hmm. how this uh, variable impacts uh, uh, in terms of uh, digital pathology would be critical as well. Oh. All right, and final thought, Brandon, from a regulatory perspective, the absence of ground truth. So, you know, pathologists are doing this right now. They're not going to be absent from a submission. They're going to be involved in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they're the, the reference standard or not, um, there's going to be some comparison to what pathologists are doing, and I think that's a, totally appropriate. And I'll say in radiology, there's a lot of devices where the radiologist is the actual um, part of the reference standard or a panel of, of radiologists are the pan, uh, are establishing the reference standard. I, so I don't think that's going to go away, and I think it's going to be leveraged a lot. And I just want to bring three things to that table, and one is to recognize that there's pathologist variability, which I don't think there's too much a disagreement on, so at least I don't have to convince people. There was a lot of effort and need to convince people of radiologist variability, but um, the, numbers, the second thing is we need to reduce that variability. Uh, the best way that I know how is, uh, is to train more training and some sort of uh, uh, credentialing or at least qualification for being the reference standard in a study uh, because I, in my research I get asked, well, what are the qualifications? And I normally say board certified and I raise my eyebrows and I'm a little uh, concerned and they say, is that good enough? And then I have had to establish some real training elements to my research so I can come back and answer that much str more strongly. And the other piece is you're, uh, you need more pathologists to, to be able to average out that variability. Now I'm not a fan of consensus on the truth because I think that is uh, sweeping away the variability. I mean, you can average three pathologists, but are you going to account for that variability? And that's the third arm of, of my uh, training is to account for that variability when you do your performance assessment. Um, and so those are the three things. Uh, recognize that there's variability, reduce that variability as much as you can. Also has to do with how you collect the data, you know, the instructions and the tools, and then finally account for that variability in the end. Thank you. So. All right, we're a little time constrained here, but if maybe I'm just going to run down the row here and see what people think. Final thought, what is, what is this, what's your probably main thing you think this is going to do to benefit the moving the field of digital pathology forward? So first. Um, first. It's a good first step. You know, we'll, we'll experientially learn. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing for the subsequent study. Brandon? I think this community and this, uh, this project can allow us for really giving some templated uh, result uh, reports so that people can just follow that. Everyone wants to know what to do. Let's, let's try and give them that ammunition, including language. And the other piece, um, I think that this can start building towards uh, a pipeline for collecting the data that could be made regulatory ready um, as a broad community and shared and made accessible so that the technology developer doesn't have to bring in the entire uh, clinical um, expertise to collect that pivotal study data. Maybe they have to figure out how to train their model and all that, but in terms of the pot of gold at the end, which is validation data that could be regulatory ready. DJ? I think this project will be a very valuable project for a lot of community laboratories who either lack uh, resources to or have expertise of computational science or who lack resources to uh, hire computational uh, people with computational expertise and, and this will impart or give, equip them with more uh, 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 skill sets to, to f at least look for what critical things when they are transitioning into digital pathology space, what are the critical factors that they should be looking for in terms of variabilities. John? I think harmonization and standardization are key, and this effort is a good first step toward doing that. If we look around the world, we have a massive shortage of pathologists globally. Um, computational pathology is a huge 
aid to the work of a pathologist and hopefully harmonization and standardization can let us see that computational pathology is an extender for what a pathologist does and can help us make the most of use of their time. Right. And finally, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's a great step, great uh, first step and with a great community with all stakeholders engaged and it will certainly help creating a reference standard set and then uh, understanding techni minimizing technical variability at least so that we can focus on biological variability that drives the response of tumor. Okay, so thanks to the panel. At this point, we can open to audience questions, which I can see that, Mike. I can't see anything over there. So, and I see somebody has their hand up over there. Um, just when you do speak, please uh, uh, tell the audience your name and your affiliation, and uh, we'll be happy to field your questions. So as we're getting set up here, just one thing that nobody touched on. Somebody want to answer a question about what's the impact of this on clinical studies? Maybe I can take a stab. And right now, the ASCO CAP guidelines is scoring HER2 from 0, 1, 2, 3. And, and so far, the, the main distinction or clinically relevant uh, uh, metric was identifying high HER2 expressing tumors. But now with the emergence of uh, uh, trastuzumab drug tan combo or antibody drug conjugate, identifying this low level HER2 expressing uh, breast cancers would be very valuable. And uh, digital computational pathology can certainly be of very value in that space. Yes. There's, there's patients there that we can help that maybe we're not right now. So please. Hi, uh, Janaki Viraraghavan, AstraZeneca. Uh, I'll question on uh, when we address sources of variability and we bring in AI-based technologies that are inherently dependent on machine learning, what is underlying the machine learning are the models and the data that are, uh, sorry, uh, is the data that is fed into those models. Uh, how would this panel consider variability that comes in from that because what you put in is what you get out? And uh, how do we address that variability? And is there a thought on or recommendations on how we would get there? Well, first person comes to mind on that one, Sarvisa. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, in a data-driven learning process, that's always there. So then, uh, then the algorithms have to create some. Uh, input and output matching where there is a corroboration that there is no hidden factor destabilizing that, but it's uh, like learning from the variability and also maybe using a consensus uh, pathologies um, set scale that, it, that has an error bar much less uh, than the, the pathologies, um, than the usual um, spread you see. Um, then training on that can help. And so there can be various mechanisms. But I would also say that if uh, underlying um, tumor biology is used in one or other way, then these, um, that should guide these uh, variabilities, uh, that should minimize the variabilities and guide the direction. And there can be other type of computational uh, algorithms like uh, we do from HNE um, that we try to quantify in a rule-based uh, way, try to quantify the underlying biological process deformation, like cell cycle deformation and others, and that could also inherently capture those directions. There's a lot, lot of work to do in this direction. It's a great question, and algorithms are trying to beat that in various ways. Thanks. Anybody else want to try that? Or I could give a so little bit of viewpoint yeah. as a reviewer of these kind of devices for many years now in the, radi in the radiology space. Um, the more information that is in that first submission about the data that was used for training and the more clarity there is on how the reference standard was uh, established and the sites were tracked and the different patient covariates are summarized, you know, the level of quality of that kind of determines how much scrutiny I have to give to the rest because if it's clear that they have taken good care of the data coming into this device, 
then I know that I have more confidence in what I'm going to see next. Um, but I do uh, admit that it is a wild west in terms of how these things, uh, how the data is described. Uh, I, I'd like to know how many sites were involved. I'd like to know the timelines and, and the devices that were used to acquire the data. Uh, and, and then patient subgroups and, po and covariates is, is critical to know whether you th can have a confidence that it's going to work in the validation setting. And then, of course, even though there might be in some um, flexibility in what we require on seeing the training data, there's going to be a lot more um, emphasis on what is uh, demonstrated in the validation data. And, and it, it, it's still a wild, wild west there. And, and, and it's surprising to me that there's not more um, just standardized descriptions of how data is used and characterized. So you're really seeking quite a bit of transparency in the training, its training set as distinct from the algorithm, right? So engineering can tell you a lot about what's yeah. going to happen yeah. in the real world. Mm -hmm. Airplanes, they can't crash every airplane to see what's going to happen to a design. And so, you know, we can learn a lot from the uh, description of the algorithm, which we ask for. And I like to think that if I'm done with reviewing that, I could take a stab at trying to do it myself. Uh, I have no way of having any time to do that, but it tells me how much they understand their own device, and that gives me a, a kind of kind of a bias in, in the review side because do we want to put all of our effort just on the validation, or can we learn something? from how the device was built. Yeah. Those, of us, those of us who are wet chemistry diagnostic developers have to learn a new field or put a different hat on or get the expertise in to really help us build up from the ground up. It's important. Yeah, so. if, if I may add to that, that, it's very important to track the factors because some factors by tracking transparently could really reduce, it could really reduce the technical variability, but tumors may have hidden factors, and that's why it can go into devices inclusion exclusion criteria that where exactly, what are the hidden factors, where exactly this is falling off, and then one has to go back to the engineering as well. <coughs> if, uh, you know, the, the, the net tumor biology direction drives the tumor's um, outcome, so some one way or other that could be incorporated or could be corroborated to make it more better. So there are various ways will be tried. Okay, thanks. So I think we have time for one more question, and I see a silhouette over there. If you could. <laughs> Ethan. Uh, Ethan Sokol. Uh, Ethan, Ethan Sokol from Foundation Medicine. Oh, hi. I uh, was curious about with the, with more complex digital pathology solutions, what the importance is of explainability or human interpretability, uh, whether you can have a black box or uh, just mm -hmm. kind of the thoughts from the panel. So is a black box acceptable? Who wants to uh, yeah. take <coughs> that on? Can I? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy ahead, to John, take yeah. a stab at it. You know, go, going back historically, and I'll date myself quite a bit, I think of this as the early days of molecular pathology, yeah. when we used to spend a lot of time at real-time PCR interpreting growth curves. Is this a positive result? Is this a negative result? Mm -hmm. Then we got black box algorithms that would look at hundreds of thousands of data points, and we didn't like that. But we learned eventually to trust the black box because it allowed us to use that diagnostic time on things that did require interpretation once we learned to trust the algorithm. So I see this as something that will probably change over time, that initially there will be a lot of skepticism of the black box algorithm, but eventually as they are proven to be accurate and true, we will learn to trust them and use that diagnostic time to look at more complex things that do require more human intervention. Yeah, and if I may add to that, um, the, uh, the corroboration, uh, along the way, the corroboration with various tumor biology factor, various phenomenological factors that pathologists can feel in their head, when they see um, that can drive the right direction for the designs, and that's important, and that 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 will also add to the explainability. Explainability is in human, and with respect to tumor outcome, explainability is important because that's where we are heading to. Why are we quantifying this, doing this diagnosis? Because we want to predict tumor response. 
So I think these will emerge, designs, better designs will emerge out of these studies and tracking. And Ethan, Ethan br bringing it to a connected purpose, I don't think this is really any different from trusting a bioinformatic pipeline, right? Once the pipeline is built, we learn to trust it. Yeah. And just sort of a subjective comment, what was black box 10 years ago, today we all sort of intuitively understand, we're all learning you know, yes. as, as the field progresses. So, did you have a, or Brandon? You know, explainability is for that end user. It's for the pathologist to, to get confidence with using the tool, and it's also for the patient, so they can maybe yeah. even be part of that uh, understanding of, of their, their specimens and, and their, their own patient, uh, their own health care. But I think explainability, for me, is describing the data sets that were used to train this architecture with all its levels and the, the special tricks that are used. And, and then the validation data set, that to me explains what's going on in, in those terms, in engineering terms. Okay. So I think I need to wrap it up now. Um, I would like to thank particularly the panelists for taking the time to prepare for this and uh, contribute here. Up. It's not easy to do. Um, and to Friends of Cancer Research for organizing this, and I would definitely say stay tuned. Um, this is the first step in the process, which is defining what the project is going to be. There's going to be a lot of work, a lot of interesting uh, results coming out of this. And for those of you who have an interest, I would encourage you to uh, get involved and participate. There's still plenty of opportunity for input. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, George, and thanks to all of our panelists and to your 40 or so fellow working group members that have been uh, a part of this, uh, getting this launched to date. Um, we really hope that this new pilot project and the willingness of multiple different developers of these d digital pathology tools to evaluate a common set of samples for this HER2 case study will provide the opportunity for understanding variability among different technologies, yet help inform future validation approaches and innovative policies. Hopefully you've heard a little bit about that today. I'd invite you to visit our website for more information as things like the study protocol and analysis plans um, become further uh, developed. Um, but for now, uh, we are going to break for lunch. Um, there will be a couple of stations in the foyer outside the ballroom. Um, we invite you to grab lunch and go ahead and bring it back here. Um, at one o'clock sharp, we'll start our uh, lunch keynote session um, with, with uh, Lauren Silvis and Scott Gottlieb. Um, you won't want to miss it, so please feel free to eat here, um, and we'll have people circulating that will be able to uh, take dishes and things. Um, so enjoy.
We'll be getting started with the program in about three minutes, so if you could uh, find your seats, that would be greatly appreciated. The program will begin in one minute. Please find your seats. Sit on the near side. Yeah. Good afternoon. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. It was a really dynamic uh, session this morning with a lot of information and some debate, but that's what we're here for. We're here to try to solve some problems and get people together and mostly get something out of it for patients. Um, so we have uh, what is classified as a dynamic duo for our lunchtime speakers, and they are in fact dynamic, and they are, they've been working together forever and ever, and I'm sure we're gonna have a wonderful interview. Um, Lauren Silvis is Senior Vice President of External Affairs at Tempest. She spent a long time at FDA, and at FDA she was Scott's Chief of Staff, wow. And how do I introduce Scott? I mean, like he has 3,000 things that I can say, and if I gave you all his titles, we wouldn't get through the day, but I guess we're gonna just say former FDA commissioner and someone who cares and who's making a difference. Thank you. Okay, bye. I didn't bring one up. You're up. I think we've been introduced. Okay, so we're ready. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, Ellen. I want to start with how Ellen started the day, um, as only Ellen could. Just so mad that um, Valid did not pass in the last Congress, but very committed to continuing to work on it. But you know, realistically, um, you know, we're heading into an election cycle. It is you know not a great time to get things done in Congress, and a tough time for the agency. And um, you know, could be faced with a change in administration. So really, just overall a tough political environment and would love to hear your thoughts on operating in a tough political environment, um, you know, prospects for the agency and how, how they can think about um, getting things done, particularly some of the things that are so important to the, the people in this room and Friends of Cancer Research. Yeah, well, I, I think we operated in, in a unique political environment. Um, I remember when I, I was first coming aboard at FDA, someone very senior in the White House said to me, 
that working in an administrative agency in the Trump administration is going to be really good because you're going to have a lot of autonomy and latitude to do things. You just have to tolerate a ceremonial firing every now and then. And you know, there was some truth to that. I remember the, you know, waking up, you, you would check Twitter in the morning. And um, you know, sometimes the Jeep pie, I remember once, the FCC commissioner, uh, there was some, Trump had tweeted out some stuff, President Trump had tweeted out some stuff that was critical of an action he had taken, really critical. You probably remember this episode. And I texted Ajit, and I said, you know, really sorry this happened. Are you OK? Is everything going to be OK? And he goes, oh, yeah, I, I don't think the president realized it was me who did that. So it wasn't personal. <laughs> um, so you know, you did think about those things. But we had a lot of, a lot of autonomy. And I think we used it. Uh, I would like to think we used it effectively. And, and there's a couple of things that we thought about doing at the time. One was, you know, I felt it was very important early on to have connectivity to the other agencies. I used to tell you this. I said, make sure you, you forge a relationship with all the chiefs of staffs at the, the relevant regulatory agencies that we had business with. And I would meet with those agency heads uh, early on. I met with all of them. And I said, let's find one thing that we can work on together so that we made sure there was something we were doing with the FTC and the DEA um, and you know, Customs and Border Protection, agencies that we knew we were going to end up having issues where we needed to work together, sometimes issues where we disagreed, to make sure that there was connectivity at the, at the leadership level. And I think that, that that played a lot of dividends. I think the other thing was just the making sure that you had close relationships to Capitol Hill and you, um, you invested in those relationships all the time. So you know, we were up on Capitol Hill. I was up there every week meeting with members, not just before I was testifying, but even in between hearings, just to hear what members wanted. And, and I think it was very important to demonstrate to members that you wanted to hear what they, they cared about, so you weren't just coming because you had an issue or you were going to be testifying before them, uh, but you wanted to hear what, what their concerns were. And also, when things arose in their districts that you knew were relevant to them, you called them, you, know, you personally briefed them. And even when we had major announcements, we would we would personally brief the members. And we would go up there also and brief the staff. Uh, I, I would go up and do briefings in this, with the staff. And I think that that was, that was important um, in educating the members. I remember one time, uh, and Carly's here as well, so she'll remember this. It was, I think it was probably 2018, the winter 2018, right before Thanksgiving. And we recalled all the romaine lettuce in the country, um, literally two days before Thanksgiving. And right after I got off the phone with my wife, who was asking me what she should do with the salad, uh, when she saw the news headline cross, I called Leon, uh, Jimmy Panetta, Leon Panetta's son, first-term congressman from, from California, very good member, uh, because we knew at that time, based on who was harvesting romaine lettuce, that it was going to be in the Salinas Valley, it was going to be within his district, and so I wanted to personally brief him on it. And, and you know, those touches end up being very important, because he's going to get calls from constituents who are going to say, what's going on? And he's going to be able to say, look, the FDA commissioner's already called me, I'm in touch with him. I'll get answers to your question. So that's important to him uh, in terms of his, his job and, and his district. And so you know, doing those touches, making sure you build those relationships end up, ends up being very important. And you know, that, that, that means you have to have good staff who can, who can service these things. Obviously, I didn't realize you know, Leon, uh, Jimmy Panetta was the, uh, the congressman from, from that district. People like Carly knew that, and you, and others. And so um, doing those touches. And then the final thing I think that we did very effectively was um, we testified a lot. You know, I, I testified in the job probably 20 times. I would do every hearing that I could do or that um, other people didn't want to do. I remember there were a couple of hearings that I didn't do. There was one on um, OTC drugs that Janet wanted to do because she said, she, she said, she came to me and said, if you do this hearing, you're going to mess it up and this is too important to me. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, Janet, you can do it. You can testify. And so she did. But I tried to get up there as much as possible, not because you know, not because it was enjoyable, it was difficult. Um, it took a lot of prep for me to get up to speed on those issues. But by putting myself in front of members in an open session, it built a lot of goodwill. Uh, it, it built trust. It made sure that we didn't get sort of nasty grams because members knew I was going to be up there in two weeks. So why would they send us, you know, a pointed letter if they can do it in open hearing on TV? And so I think that was very important. So all those things were very important. You know, the the, the connectivity around the administration, working with the agency heads, working with Capitol Hill, and then just the fact that in that administration, and I think it was particular to that administration, uh, there was a little less adult supervision. Like we were able to operate independently as an agency. And as long as you were mindful of the issues that the White House would care about, and I made sure that I would bring those issues to the White House, they kind of allowed us to 
manage the rest of the portfolio uh, a little bit independently. I, I, that could be different uh, in, a, in a sort of Trump 2.0. I think that in, in a second term, there'd probably be more recognition of the importance of controlling the administrative agencies. So I think there may be less autonomy than there was in the first term. But there was a lot of autonomy in the first term. And that was very different than, for example, the Bush administration, where everything had to go through OMB. The White House exerted a lot of control. And I think Mark McClellan, when I was there with him, uh, had to operate in a, in a different way. Yeah. Those were def definitely some of the challenges and memories. Um, <laughs> but some of the, you know, some tough times. But um, you know, I know that some of, some of the best times and some of the things um, that you know, we were most enthusiastic about were seeing um, the, the products come through, the new technologies, the most promising drugs. Um, and you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about you know, what you're seeing now and um, you know, sort of out there outside of FDA and what you think the agency could be doing to make sure that these you know, promising treatments and technologies um, reach patients. Yeah, well, I think you know, the one observation I would make about just the agency's orientation to the, to the market more generally, when I, was there, when I was there in 2003 working as a senior advisor to Mark, and I had arguably, and even when I was there as, back as deputy commissioner, and arguably I had less visibility into the agency from those roles than I did when I was, came back as commissioner, but I had some visibility and I interacted with the professional staff. I think that there was generally a little bit more embedded skepticism of some of the new areas of technology and remember, it was a different time. Um, it was, we were early on in the course of developing therapeutic antibodies and developing targeted drugs in oncology. Uh, and some of the biology wasn't well validated. And so there was a little bit more inherent skepticism of the areas of new technology. I remember being in the office. M Mark made a point of on major drug approvals that he would, we would have a press call and he would announce the approval from his office. And, and he'd bring in the staff who had worked on the approval. And that was a departure from what the agency had done previously. And I remember after the approval of Avastin, someone who had worked on that approval, you know, m we were all enthused about it in the front office. We thought it was going to be an important advance. And someone who had worked on that approval after the press call turned to us and said, w you know, we don't think this is going to be very good, this drug. And it and just was shocking to me, that point of view. And it obviously, in retrospect, turned out to be wrong. I, I think the, the ethos of the agency really changed when I came back as commissioner. What I saw was, you know, still an agency that was very rigorous and, and cautious, appropriately so, but more inclined to believe that a new therapeutic platform could be potentially transformative and could provide a lot of public health advantage. And I think that that, that emanated from a lot, of, a lot of experience and seeing some of these new, these new technology platforms really have an impact on patients. You know, what I'm, what I'm looking at right now, what I think could be a very uh, promising area of development are, you know, what you sort of r broadly call N of one types of therapies. But therapies where you have tailoring to specific patients based on the profile of the patients, particularly on oncology, but even in, in genetic diseases, you know, these sort of N of one siRNA oligonucleotides where every genetic perturbation is slightly different from patient to patient, or what we're seeing uh, Moderna do in, com in collaboration with Merck with, with mRNA to prime an immune response to cancers, or even what we're seeing with CAR-T, where we're seeing CAR-T start to get extended in early development programs into solid tumors, but what they're doing is developing CAR-T therapies that are very specifically tailored to the antigenic profile of patients' um, individual tumors, kind of what Steve Rosenberg's been doing for 20, 25 years at the NCI, and now we're seeing it potentially you know, get conceptualized into therapies. I think that's going to take a, a different regulatory paradigm that I'm not sure the agency has quite perfected yet, where you're going to, where the, the product is the process and what you're going to get approval for isn't necessarily a single product, but the biological plausibility that provides for uh, the ability to make products that are tailored to the patients. And that's kind of a, a different paradigm for the agency. I think that there are constructs that could be imported, particularly from the medical device side, the, the sort of firm-based approach where, you, where you're approving um, you know, a firm's overall approach to manufacturing that could get ported over into the drug development scheme. But it's gonna need, it, we're going to need to rethink the drug approval process, and it may require some legislative changes from Congress to really enable a robust pathway. Because I, th they're, they're, all the early development work is creating a lot of exciting opportunities, but I don't think that it'd be a very easy approval pathway right now. And the question is how much 
how much reproducibility in terms of the clinical effect you need to demonstrate in order for there to be confidence that the biological premise actually is sound. And right now, I don't know the answer to that question, and I don't think anyone else does. And you know, you could have situations where you could have, for example, a CAR T therapy that you know, you're tailoring it to the antigenic profile of tumors, and you're producing a very robust treatment effect over a population. Some patients are responding very well, some patients aren't. But the overall treatment effect may be more robust than a small molecule drug that where the treatment effects only in 20% of patients. FDA will approve the small molecule drug because they're used to approving drugs where you see sort of binomial responses or, or very, very um, bifurcated responses where only a certain percentage of patients are responders, but the overall statistical value of the, the trial is sufficient. But in the other instance where there may be more statistical validity about the treatment that you're delivering, they, they would be very uncomfortable because how do, you, how do you extrapolate to the, if you're testing it in 50 patients, show a robust response, how do you extrapolate to that 51st and 52nd patient? So that may require some kind of different framework. And I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, particularly in oncology. Yeah, I, you know, your comment about the process being the product is something we've talked about in the context of AI and, you know, the need for, um, you know, the, the right tailored approaches to thinking about all the AI that's coming through medical product development and, um, you know, as the devices themselves. So can you talk a little bit more about that approach in terms of, um, you know, how it could help with um, regulation of AI? Well, look, I think where AI is going to be most impactful in the near term, and obviously FDA has approved a lot of AI medical devices, machine learning devices, where the approval is based on closed data sets. So FDA has confidence in the clinical validity of the training sets that the tools are being trained on. I think the complexity becomes when you're looking at large language models uh, where you, know, you, don't, you don't have as much confidence in, in the, the quality of the clinical training sets, at least not yet. And so there might be variability in what the AI tool is providing. And the AI, remember, is solving, isn't solving for accuracy, it's solving for plausibility. And there's a lot of places in business and, and even in medicine where plausibility is good enough, but it's not always good enough. Sometimes you need accuracy and the AI tools aren't solving for that. So, the, so you know, the, I think the near-term applications are gonna be on, on the delivery side. You know, the AI tools potentially interfacing directly with patients, which I think they could be doing now, and I think that there's a path for doing that. And then I think on the drug discovery side, where the AI tools are gonna be like the advent of structure-based drug design back in the early 2000s, you know, 2003, 2004, when we started to do X-ray crystallography, and that started to be a very robust tool, and now it's embedded in a lot of discovery and development platforms where you're developing new molecules, I think the AI tools are going to be very effective there. And it, with respect to drug discovery, I don't think that we need a new regulatory framework because I think at the end of the day, if you have a molecule coming out of a discovery platform that is heavily dependent upon AI tools to try to make sense of multi-omic data and come up with biologically plausible targets or molecules that are well tailored to, to novel targets, it's going to go through a conventional development pathway. FDA is going to require you to randomize to patients. If you're proposing to use an AI tool to, to stratify the patient population that you're going to put the drug into development with, that's no different than a multivariate test now using multivariate tests. You know, you're probably going to have to randomize to the general population and in this selected population, maybe not, depending on your biological argument, but that, that doesn't strike me as a very difficult um, task. I think the more difficult task is when, if you want to use an AI tool to actually provide direct patient care, and I think the, the capabilities are there to do that. The telehealth platforms are, are using these tools right now, but they're still keeping the doctor in the middle. So it's clinical decision support software, and it's not a medical device yet, because I think they're worried about the regulatory process. I think there's a pathway for that. I think probably you're gonna have to go indication by indication to get the approval. You know, you pick the top 20 chief complaints, and you start getting approvals for some of those chief complaints, and then you can layer those onto telehealth platforms, or even in a doctor's office where they're doing the initial triage and managing a certain cohort of patients who present in a very, sort of cookie cutter way. You know, what are, what are the top complaints? Pain on urination, lower back pain. You know, there, there are things that an AI tool might be able to triage and handle patients of, of low complexity and maybe even make, be able to make a prescribing decision. I think, I think we're almost there, and but for companies being worried about grappling with the regulatory process, which I think it, the, the door is more open than people perceive right now. The regulation, I mean, just to sort of close, but the, you know, my view is the regulation is going to be on the front end of the back end. FDA is not going to be able to rip apart these, these algorithms, and so you're going to want to provide for um, regulation about what the province of the 
clinical training set? You know, what how, is it representative? How do you how do you validate some of the data that gets put into those training sets and make sure that there is um, comparability across definitions that are being used in those training sets? And then on the back end, validating the um, the tool against some reference standard, which we have a lot of models now. CDRH has developed a lot of models for doing that. We did it with next generation sequencing. Um, so, so the constructs there. Uh, and final point I'll make, and I don't want to belabor this too much. I think valid was an optimal framework for the um, regulation of AI medical devices, and it's unfortunate that valid didn't pass in the context of. IVDs and LDTs, uh, and FDA was forced down a pathway where they had to promulgate regulations under the existing framework because I don't think the 510K PMA framework is a modern framework that's well adapted to some of the new technology, but it is what it is, and I think CDRH is making the best use of the existing authorities that they can, particularly with what they announced yesterday. But I would go back and look at those the, the structures that were conceived and valid and see whether or not you could um, reintroduce those constructs specifically tailored to AI. And once you get those kind of constructs and authorities embedded in statute somewhere, then you can start to contemplate whether or not you can port them over into other areas of, of device regulation and maybe even eventually drug regulation. But I think that they, they, they speak very well to how we should be approaching um, AI with things like the firm-based approach. I mean, there, there is a lot in valid that, you know, could make sense for these AI tools. And as you, as you see um, FDA moving into this area, I mean, you talked about the, the products and you talked about the specific potential regulatory um, paradigms there. But can you also talk about just like how you thought about moving into these new areas, like how you manage the, you know, the politics of it? Um, you know, the public perception of, you know, FDA stepping into new areas. We've talked about, you know, tobacco, food safety as examples during your tenure where the agency really had to, you know, go into an area in a way that was ultimately going to be successful because they had no other choice. They had to regulate and um, needed to do it in a balanced way. Yeah, look, I think sometimes you have to make accommodations. What I, what I used to say a lot, and you used to hear me say this, was I'll take 90%. You know, I'll, I'll, if, if I can get 90% of the regime implemented, I'll leave the last 10% on the table if I think it's going to imperil the whole regime. And the place where this was most manifest was on tobacco regulation, where if we had figured out a way to carve out premium cigars, we would have accelerated what we were doing on tobacco much more quickly. I think we would have gotten the regulation out on menthol. I think we would have you know, advanced the regulation on regulating nicotine further. A lot of the opposition, and you can argue, well, if it wasn't the premium cigars, it was going to be something else. I don't think that was necessarily true. I think if we had shown some flexibility and accommodation on premium cigars, which ended up being a third rail, both on Capitol Hill and at the White House at the time, the rest of the, the, we had general support for the other things that we were doing, and I think we would have been able to push that forward. But, you know, we couldn't get accommodation out of the center, CTP, not because they, they you know, didn't want to be flexible and didn't recognize, you know, the politics of the moment, but I think they just couldn't conceive of a way that we, they were going to create a public health rationale for carving out premium cigars. So we, we sacrificed a lot of the agenda, certainly the speed of implementing the agenda. I think in other places we, we were able to get 90 percent. You know, we, I remember when we were implementing the, the whole regulatory regime around stem cell therapy, all these clinics that were, you know, promulgating cell therapies that were arguably drugs and saying it un was under the guise of the practice of medicine, so we were going to take on that whole field. You know, at the time, the discussions with Peter and, and, and the group was, if we end up trying to go after every orthopedic surgeon in the country who's doing, you know, infusions of injections of platelet-rich plasma uh, in joints, maybe it's having a treatment effect, maybe it's not, it's pretty low risk. Um, or if we go after every plastic surgeon that's spinning down adipose stem cells and injecting it in your cheeks and saying it's rejuvenating your skin when maybe it's probably having a cosmetic effect rather a mechanical effect more than anything else, we're not going to get the rest of this regime implemented. And there's real risk here. There's people who are doing things that are literally killing patients. Why don't we find a way to exercise enforcement discretion? That was a hard thing to swallow at the time for the agency, but by doing that, we were able to implement the regime successfully um, and you know, get it sustained in court and get it implemented, get the guidance out. And I do think that if we had gone after everything and not been willing to exercise enforcement discretion that one, in that one realm, 
you would have had Capitol Hill stepping in to block what we did. And the same thing with what we did on, on the things around produce regulation where, you know, we got a lot of opposition from the Department of Agriculture and they were lo actively lobbying the Hill against us or with menu labeling where we made certain accommodations, uh, certain accommodations for small restaurants at the time to kind of carve them out of some of the regulation and we made accommodations with the farmers to allow test inspections of, of their farms on, um, with, with the produce. Uh, we simplified the form and so there were things that we did to try to be accommodative that took some of the um, bite out of the opposition, made it harder to, uh, to be opposed. And then we, you know, we went out and told our story, tried to tell a story very effectively. I remember when I was worried that people were going to lobby the White House on the menu labeling, I traveled up to New York to do an episode of Fox and Friends on Saturday morning, and that was, you know, that was for an audience of one, um, <laughs> where, I, where I talked about the fact that menu labeling had inspired me to eat um, egg white delights because they were low in, in calories and um, they looked heart healthy because, the, you know, McDonald's had, had embraced menu labeling and stuff. I think you remember that episode. I, I remember uh, I never lived, commissioner I never lived it down. <laughs> I got so many McDonald's <laughs> gift cards after that. Yep. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we, we, we sort of tried to be accommodative where it was reasonably accommodative and we, and we, we settled for 90 percent. And that, that, I think, is an important lesson. And it's very hard. I understand, the, I'll just pause here, but I understand the, the ethos of the agency is if you exercise enforcement discretion, you carve something out, it's hard to get it back. And that is true. Um, but, you know, so you have to be very conscious of what you're doing and why you're doing it. But if it's a choice between you know, getting a whole regulatory regime implemented that's going to provide a lot of public health benefit and carving something out and worrying about it a little later, uh, I, I would take the 90 percent. Well, we said we'd leave time for questions. There's about five minutes left. Um, you know, hopefully we get some more questions that prompt these good stories. Uh, does anyone want to take, do we have someone coming down over there? Do we have anyone else? Except Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> we did not plant this one. I don't know what she's going to say. Uh, yeah, you always have to be careful with me. Um, <laughs> uh, so, Scott, I was fascinated by the end of one, and of course that's where we need to go, but how do we do this in an environment that really hates pharma? Drug pricing is an issue. We are talking about accessibility, which is important but not a lot of talk about innovation. How do we balance that? And of course, the budgets are cut. How do we keep going forward <clears throat> so we truly can help patients in an environment that is very anti-pharma and frankly, anti-FDA? Yeah, I don't, um, I don't think that the sort of uh, hostility towards the industry it is, is the impediment here. Um, I think it really is at what point I think it's really a sort of scientific regulatory construct, which is the question of at what point can is, is a biologically sound argument that's demonstrated to be reproducible in a reasonably sized clinical study um, providing enough confidence that the underlying premise is sufficient that you could approve the process as a product subject to post-market validation and leaning more heavily on continued data collection on all those N of ones that you couldn't study in the primary, in, in the primary study, and then what is the construct for making that approval? It's very hard. You know, the FDA has to back into the whole CMC portion of the approval, and they need a product to regulate, and here you're, you're basically approving a process for developing s a product that is slightly bespoke for each patient based on a biological premise. I, I just don't, I don't know that the existing authorities give the agencies sufficient flexibility, and I don't know if the agency is going to be aggressive enough in taking advantage of those, at least on the drug side of the house. I think you might get more flexibility if this was sort of a device construct, um, but I don't know if you'll get it on the drug side of the house absent legislation. And so I think thinking through, you know, what what the definitions are for the thresholds that need to be reached so you give the agency sort of a target to shoot at and write regulations against is where we're going to have to go. I don't think that there would be opposition to this in the broader um, community that's worried about high drug prices and drugs coming onto the market with insufficient data packages because we're talking about situations where there's probably not going to be available therapy. 
where there's a lot of bi biological plausibility to what you're doing. You know, you talk about rare genetic diseases or cancers that are poorly treated with, with available therapy today. I just don't think that that's something that people are going to politically shoot at. I hope not. <laughs> hmm? We have another question? Hey, Scott. Hey, how are you? Uh, uh, in the past, we've spoken about diagnostics a lot, and I know you love that field generally. I was hoping to get your reaction on a couple of things. One of them is this proposal to downclassify companion diagnostics um, as something that came out yesterday. Just your reaction on it. And plus, do you think Valid, with all that amazing work that went into Valid, is there a chance for Valid to come back to the Hill at all? Because now we just heard at the JPM meeting the CEO of LabCorp saying, please, we want Valid back, which is an amazing thing to do. Yeah, look, uh, on, on Valid, I think that there is a chance that this comes back. I, you have to remember these legislative cycles are very long, and, and the sort of time between introducing a, a legislative idea and it becoming embedded in a statute could be 20 years, and you just you need to play the long game, and I think that the leadership of CDRH has been very good at that, and other people have. I remember when back in 2005 I was at FDA and I went out and gave a speech at GPHA, GPHA proposing generic drug user fees, and you know, it made front page news in, in, in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal, and GPHA came out and denounced me, and Henry Waxman, who was speaking right before me at the conference, came out and denounced the idea. And I got a call from someone pretty senior in the department saying, you know, really bold of you to do that, right idea, you know, sorry your tenure is going to be so short-lived. <laughs> um, and, and, and like I was told I was going to be fired for that. And you know, GPHA came around, we proposed the idea, we worked it up, we introduced it, got support in OMB for it. You know, and eventually it passed, 20, literally like 15 years later. So I wouldn't give up on Valid yet. I think in terms of what FDA did yesterday, uh, I think it was ex extremely forward thinking. And my first reaction was, shoot, why didn't I think, didn't think of that? <laughs> um, but it's going to substantially lower the cost of the regulation now in, in front of OMB. And so it makes that much more But I think it's going to really provide flexibility for drug companies, for example to promulgate drug diagnostic combinations now where you're not going to be dependent upon a single lab to run the test, but other labs are going to be able to now run the test after you validate it um, through an initial clinical study. I think it's going to change the, um, the commercial model there, and maybe more of the, the economics are going to be, have to be provided by the drug maker itself rather than the, the diagnostic lab that used to get the monopoly around the provision of those tests. But I think that will get worked out. Um, but I think it was, it was a really smart, sort of forward-thinking move by the FDA. And, and the final thing I'll say is I think it recognizes fundamentally that a test that is providing information to a treatment decision is fundamentally lower risk than a device that's being implanted in the patient has to perform over 15 years. You know, the, the information, there's certain situations where the information is going to be binary and you're going to make a critical decision on the basis of that. I'm sure FDA is going to look differently at that. And they said certain infectious disease tests they would carve out of this new, this new framework. But for the most part, you know, this, these, this is information being provided to providers who are looking at a whole gestalt of information. And it's one element of how they're going to make decisions. And, and it does represent lower risk. And I think that CDRH has has kind of recognized this over time. Even in the context of COVID, you know, I never would have thought that they would have gotten, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, will CDRH ever approve an at-home diagnostic for a dangerous infectious disease so patients can self-diagnose at home? If you would have asked me that question when we were there, I'd be like, nah, it's never gonna happen. You know, it's crazy. Um, and yet they came around to recognizing the value in doing that. And so I think the agency has, um, has really changed its view about what, what, how diagnostics are being used in the overall care continuum. We just got the last question, please. Thank you. This we'll is the best commissioner ever. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, this will be our last question. Thanks, um, Alex Azar, MD Anderson. Um, you were you were a voice of sanity during during COVID, um, amongst many other voices. Um, I, I was wondering, if, you know, from from your, you know, trying to communicate with the public and shape the battlefield there, are there lessons that you learned that would be applicable to how we educate the public to try to get done some of the things that we're trying to get done here in the cancer space? Yeah, I mean, I, I think at, at, with FDA, uh, going back to like the early the 2000s when we had a spate of drug withdrawals, you know, mifepristone, trovan, triglitazone, we had the uh, issues of suicidality around SSRIs. 
FDA was initially very reluctant to talk about emerging drug safety issues because there was a view that if you go out too early and talk about what you're concerned about, you're going to scare the public and people aren't going to you know, seek out, they're going to come off therapy and not seek out therapy. And, and what we recognized was, no, we needed to talk about these things early, tell people what we were looking at, but reassure them that we're going to get to the bottom of it. And as long as we reassure them we're going to get to the bottom of it and put it in a proper context, the public actually won't do the wrong thing. They'll get it. Um, and there was a way to communicate risk information where you could both inform the public and not drive bad decision making. I think in the context of COVID, there was a lot of reluctance among some public health officials to be much more binary and, and provide and try to exude much more certainty than th certainly there was, but maybe even they felt. And if we had kind of in, inject, because they didn't want people to stop doing things. They didn't want people to stop you know, wearing masks. They didn't want people to not get vaccines. They didn't want people to crowd into bars again and, and, and avoid the mitigation. And I think that there was a way to promulgate some of the uncertainty around some of the things we were asking the public to do and still get a lot of people to agree to the behavior collectively. Um, there was a way to say, you know, we're not sure if this is aerosolized or it's droplets, but we think it's droplets, and if it's droplets, these things are going to work, and so we're asking the public to do it. And when we get an answer, we're going to let you know. If we, if we find out we were wrong and this is actually aerosolized and this stuff isn't as helpful, we're going to tell you as soon as we know. And not only did we not promulgate the information in that way and the advice in that way, but we did, weren't timely with the updates. We perpetuated these, um, these requirements for far too long beyond the point in which we knew that there was uncertainty around them. And I say we, I mean collectively. I'm, the, the whole public health community, you know, the six foot distancing rule, which is probably the single <laughs> costliest piece of mitigation that we implemented. It's what forced schools to be closed because no one could provide for six, six feet of distancing. We should have revisited that much sooner than we did. It was, fine. It was, it was understandable to adopt that at the outset because we thought this was a flu-like paradigm. It was being spread by flu. But once it was clear that it wasn't being spread by flu, it didn't matter if you were six feet or like 16 feet. Uh, it was still going to be highly infectious, and we should have started to, to change the guidance sooner. So I think the lesson is you can, you can communicate uncertainty as part of risk communication and actually still achieve most of what you want to from a public health standpoint in terms of driving collective action. Um, and you need to be much quicker to ad adopt your guidance as you learn new things. All right, I know we're both scared of not keeping Ellen on time. <laughs> so thank you. Um, thank you for those comments. It was wonderful to be up here with you. Thank you both very much for joining us today for uh, your thoughtful insights, your service, and uh, everything that you continue to do. Uh, our last session today, um, as we add a few chairs here, I'll invite our panelists to uh, start making their way up to the stage. Um, this session, we will tie to aim. Uh, we will aim to try and tie together the concepts that have been presented throughout the day already. Uh, whether it be increasing complexity of biomarkers, the use of digital pathology tools used in diagnosis and patient identification, or AI in research and healthcare, science is rapidly evolving. Um, and our next panel will help discuss the future policies that are needed in order to catalyze those scientific achievements and advancements into the future. So I am pleased to introduce uh, first on stage here, Kate Rawson of Provision Policy, who will moderate the discussion. Kate, thank you. Great. Let me just turn it on. I think it's uh, good. All right. Oh, thank you, everybody, for adhering to the, uh, the seating map that we were, that we were given. Um, uh, I just want to welcome everyone to our, uh, our third and final panel session for today. I mean, we've had, I've been just almost overwhelmed by the panels and discussions um, this morning. I think um, we can really, gives us an opportunity to close everything out with what I'm, I'm sure is going to be um, a really energetic and um, an interesting uh, discussion. I also want to thank um, Jeff and Ellen and Ryan, everybody at Friends of Cancer Research um, for, for um, holding this meeting and for asking me to come back again. I, I think that it's clear from today's discussions and yesterday's announcement, you know, that, that Friends is really unparalleled when it comes to um, convening folks that might not want to convene um, and getting people to collaborate that wouldn't normally uh, naturally do so and then, um, and then have some real um, 
uh, impact um, on, on the back end. So um, we all know, as we've been hearing uh, all this whole day, that ensuring the accuracy and reliability of diagnostic tests um, is critical to patients so that they receive the appropriate treatment. Um, this discussion um, will explore existing regulatory paradigms, um, some proposed policies that we've already hit on a little bit today um, that are aimed at enhancing the, di the uh, diagnostic test um, development and review processes. And then we can also look ahead and, and highlight uh, the need for uh, emerging technologies. Um, and we also have the benefit, again, of, of being able to respond to or expand on things that we have heard from the sessions earlier. So I'm going to really try to briefly um, introduce our, our panel in the order that they're seated from your left to right. So seated next to me is um, Mike Berger, who runs the Berger Lab at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, the lab uses novel computational and experimental techniques to characterize the spectrum of genetic mutations in human tumors in order to identify biomarkers of cancer progression and drug response. Sitting next to Mike, we have Joe Lennertz, Chief Scientific Officer at Boston Gene. Um, Boston Gene uses AI-based molecular and immune profiling to analyze cancer tumors and guide therapeutic decision-making for individual cancer patients. Um, seated in our middle chair um, is Carly McWilliams. She is Head of Regulatory Policy North America at Roche Diagnostics. And prior to joining Roche in 2020, Carly was senior counsel to um, FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb and Stephen Hahn, and then also worked on Capitol Hill on the House side. Um, Lisa Rydell is a patient and survivor advocate. She was diagnosed with ALK positive lung cancer in December of 2017, and she's active with the advocacy group Longevity. And then from FDA, we're lucky to have Brittany Shuck, the Deputy Office Director at the Office of In Vivo Diagnostics at CDRH. Um, she has been at FDA since 2017 after completing her postdoc research as a fellow at the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, otherwise known as NCATS. And then at the far end of the road down there, we have Anthony or, or um, Nino Sarecki, who is S uh, Senior Vice President of Clinical Biomarker and Diagnostic Development at LOXO at Lilly, um, which as we know has an impressive oncology pipeline. So as you can see, we have a panel with a breadth of experience from industry, FDA, acad academic labs, um, and importantly, the patient perspective. So we're gonna engage in a 45 minute or so uh, Q&A up here, and then we're gonna be inviting your questions in the last 15 minutes. Um, obviously, those in the room with us today, those mics will come down and you'll be able to, uh, to line up. And then our virtual audience can submit their questions um, through the Q&A function on the Zoom platform, which should come up right in front of me. So um, as I know, you know we'll, I'll direct certain questions to, to certain panelists, but everybody should feel free to jump in as we go. Don't be shy. Um, one quick programming note as we get started. I know um, Jeff Sharon talked about this already. The elephant in the room on all of this, which is not an elephant anymore because we've already talked about it, is um, uh, LDTs. Um, we know the background of that. There, that uh, proposed rule from FDA isn't yet final. We know the agency is going through those comments. Um, so we can't really discuss what the final rule will look like since um, FDA, those are all still under review. Okay, so let's get into it. Brittany, I'm gonna start with you. Um, so, FDA has been, as we've heard, you know, very vocal and active in pushing for a more modernized approach um, to diagnostic regulation. And so I wonder if you can just briefly sort of elaborate on what we've already heard on FDA's current approach and future vision to regulating diagnostic tests, uh, particularly in light of the really rapid um, advancements that we're seeing in medical technology. And I know you, you know, you may want to expand on some of the points that were raised by, by Jeff Sharon and others during their keynotes. Sure, yeah, thanks, Katie. 
Uh, so first, I just want to say how excited I am to be here. I appreciate you all um, inviting me here uh, to interact with you all, sit on this great panel um, on this very important topic. Um, obviously, as a deputy office director um, in the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics, I spend a lot of my time, I'd say most of my times, my days, my nights, my weekends, thinking about um, this very topic and working on this very topic. Second, as Katie said, um, let's just all wave to the elephant in the room. <laughs> um, you know, she mentioned we're not going to be able uh, to talk about what um, the final rule uh, might look like. Um, but as Jeff mentioned uh, earlier this morning, uh, we are moving forward uh, to finalize that rule. Um, and that's a priority for us. And so, uh, you know, we'd be remiss without, you know, at least acknowledging it when we're talking about looking forward. Um, Katie, back to your point. Uh, about you know FDA's vocal support of a modernized framework for um, in vitro diagnostics. Um, yes, we have been uh, vocal on that, um, and we do see value in having a modernized framework. Um, it can provide for things that we don't have today. For example, like novel pre-make pre-market review pathways, something like a certification program for a test developer's capabilities um, based on a given technology, um, such that we're looking at those capabilities, um, for example, for making and validating tests um, in lieu of individual pre-market review um, for many different types of tests. Um, there's also potentially an opportunity for mandating uh, transparency um, for test performance um, for all tests. Um, but, you know, as I think has been alluded to today, um, the power for a modernized framework really rests um, with Congress. Um, so in the meantime, we're looking at, okay, what can we do and are doing in our current framework? Um, so I do want to talk, if you don't mind, a little bit about that today. So, um, you know, I think first and foremost, you've heard uh, from across the board at folks at, at FDA, our goal is timely and continued as access to safe and effective high quality in vitro diagnostics um, and making sure that patients and providers have the appropriate tests they need to make uh, their patient care decisions. So to do this, we want to make sure um, that we have the right regulatory touch. Um, and so Jeff, you know, talked this morning, and I think everyone's aware of our announcement yesterday of our intention to initiate the reclassification process um, for most IVDs um, that are currently class three. And this would be to reclassify into class two. Um, and we do uh, see that that could be uh, a way to uh, improve competition and improve uh, access um, to these tests. Um, also, as part of that statement, um, and in an ongoing effort, uh, continuing our risk-based approach for initial classifications. So as Je Jeff mentioned, you know, based on our experience with companion diagnostics generally, um, which as we all know are essential for the safe and effective use of a corresponding therapeutic, including oncology drug products, um, you know, we believe that moving forward, most of those could potentially be, um, you know, class two um, in that 510K less burdensome pathway. Um, we talked about innovation and improvement, um, something that we um, are encouraging and want to see more of are the use of predetermined change control plans. Um, and so this is having a plan up front for changes that you would want to make to your test um, and telling us how you would make that change, how you would validate uh, that change, what would be the acceptable performance for that change. And then if we see that in a pre-market submission, um, you can make that change, test developers can make that change, I should be clear, um, you know, and, um, and, and not have to come back for pre-market review. So, you know, addressing changes um, and, and the pace of innovation in that way. Um, you know, I think one of the common themes that we've heard a lot about today um, is standardization and harmonization. I mean, we really see um, that being a key piece uh, moving forward. Um, I think one of the big pieces that we heard in both panels today is making sure that as we move towards um, harmonization and standardization that we have the right right materials and methods, um, that we have the right samples, um, that we have information on the clinical truth or the clinical status of that, that sample so that when we're looking at concordance and we're looking at accuracy, what does it mean clinically, um, you know, in terms of the output of the test and the intended use of the test? So do we have that information uh, that we need? Um, and then certainly, you know, taking lessons learned um, from COVID and just highly interactive uh, nature during that time and trying to put out additional FDA resources. Um, for example, templates we heard, you know, during COVID folks really like that to be able to provide information to FDA to have a more streamlined uh, review process. So definitely, you know, things to work on in terms of communication. Uh, Jeff mentioned the, the TAP pilot. Um, so while we're waiting our turn for that, um, we're not in the pilot yet in our office, you know, but taking some of those principles to continue that high, 
you know, high level of engagement and continuous engagement uh, to work with the community to get um, these safe and effective IVDs um, to our patients and our providers. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, Leah, just to, to build on that, you know, it's, it's not always apparent to patients. And, and Ellen said that in her opening remarks this morning. Sometimes even physicians, when, when a test has been, whether or not a test has been, you know, robustly developed and validated, I think it's fair to say that not all tests are created equal. And so I wonder, you know, Leah, as a, as a patient and survivor advocate, um, what are your assumptions um, regarding tests that have been offered by your specialist or your primary care physician, um, you know, how do you, and, and then also, how do you perceive the role of regulatory bodies like FDA um, in addressing those concerns? Um, well, as a patient, I'm going in with the, with the assumption that all these tests have already gone through mm -hmm. rigorous review and um, that there have been stringent requirements that have been fulfilled in order for the test to even come to market and be prescribed by my physician. Because as a patient, I'm relying on my provider to have that information available for me. Mm -hmm. um, and as mentioned earlier, the reliability and accuracy of the testing is so critical because it informs the treatment decisions and ultimately informs outcomes for patients. So it's really important that we get it right, especially the first time initially in a cancer diagnosis. You want to make sure that the patients are on the right treatments that match whatever type of cancer they have. Um, and also to avoid unnecessary suffering. If, for instance, a patient is eligible for targeted therapy treatment, but we don't have accurate biomarker testing and they're put on other treatments like chemotherapy, um, not only does that affect how long a patient, patient survives, but it could also cause undue suffering that could be avoided if we had done the proper testing from, from day one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And can you compare and contrast how patients think about tests versus treatments in terms of the scrutiny that they assume that those, and, and, and how, um, are you ask more questions about the drugs and, or than you would a diagnostic test, or what's that conversation like with your physician? Um, I, I definitely ask more questions about treatments versus about the testing. Um, I, I hardly even think about the testing part and whether or not that's reliable. Now, if a patient is not responding to treatment, now, is, that, is there a role for retesting? Do we just assume that they are not responding because it's just the biology of the cancer? Or do we kind of go back to the drawing board and say, you know what, maybe we need to look at the accuracy of the testing that was done in the beginning. Mm -hmm. so, so definitely, I kind of focus my scrutiny on the, te the treatments versus the testing, because like I said earlier, I just assume that all that work has already been done yeah. beforehand. Yeah, okay. Um, so, Nino, um, just based on what Leah just said, you know, from your perspective um, at LOXO, you know, how, how do you account for potential variability in, the per in performance and test results across across the diagnostics that are used within your studies, and, and what role do you envision the current and some of these proposed regulatory um, efforts um, playing, and, and what aspects of those seem beneficial to you? Yeah. So first of all, Leah, pleasure to be on the panel with you. It's good, great to hear a patient's perspective on this, especially testing, which as a pathologist, you don't normally hear a lot from your patients, so very valuable. Um, <clears throat> and also thanks to fr Friends of Cancer Research for having me on the panel. I think, you know, first and foremost, we're just as interested as everyone else on this stage uh, about getting accurate and timely diagnosis for our patients so the right patients come on trial, the right patients are treated with our drugs, and the right patients are then <coughs> subsequently identified for commercial drug. <clears throat> so, you know, that's baseline. I think we also realize that um, former policies requiring central testing for, bio for confirmation of biomarker status can actually be detrimental to patients. Number one, because they can add to the time that the patient has to wait before coming on trial. Number two, because they utilize additional tissue, which is not always available in, in high grade or, or high stage cancers. Um, and um, you know, number three, they, they oftentimes, especially for um, you know, patients treated at large academic medical centers, have access to that diagnostic already and have, have a biomarker. So at LOXO, we, we've, we've tried to take an approach where we, we validate or try to use results from local lab tests, tests that are performed at high-quality laboratories, high-quality assays, to enroll 
um, in, in trial. And the way we do that is we work with the laboratory to understand their clinical validation packages. What, what is the performance of the assay for that particular biomarker when available? Or what, when not available, at least, what is the, what's the performance in that class of, of uh, genomic variant? Um, for example, infusions. Um, and, then, and then we ensure that we procure as much tissue as possible for retrospective bridging to a central diagnostic. And we've done that twice already to show a fairly high concordance between testing done at high quality laboratories under the direction of molecular pathologists or, or trained pathologists, um, and, and then uh, bridging, that stud, bri bridging those samples to a central test. Um, and that's been successful. We find that's a nice balance to get patients access, ensure quality, and then eventually meet the, uh, uh, the requirements of, of the agency to have a, a companion diagnostic. I will say I'm encouraged by some of the changes that, I'm, that we're experiencing and hearing about from the agency, particularly the, um, the OCE's um, CDX pilot program, which I think we touched on a bit today, allowing for a minimum standard of quality, or I should say at least a, a universal standard of quality uh, for de uh, defining a biomarker and enrollment at trial. I think that's going to be really valuable in raising the, the, the quality of all uh, available diagnostics, not just the one device, one biomarker, one drug. And then what we heard yesterday, and I'm, I'm going to speak minimally about this because I haven't had a chance to dive into it with my regulatory colleagues, but, but seems to be uh, heading in that same direction uh, of, of allowing um, uh, a less onerous uh, validation requirements for an assay, thereby maintaining quality while in, in improving access. Yeah. Bottom line, we, we want high quality testing available at clinical trial. Um, for our patients, we want rapid access to that, that testing for the appropriate uh, enrollment of patients. And then obviously we want that same access uh, for commercial drug. Yeah. The, the OCE, the, the oncology pilot, um, I think we, we heard from Jeff that maybe no one has signed up quite yet. Um, from an industry perspective, can you, what are, can you outline maybe some benefits that you might see as to why you would want to dip your toe in, in that? So, so we're interested, <laughs> um, <laughs> we've, and we've, we've talked to the agency about this. So, the, you know, it basically codifies what we've been trying to do at LOXO, which is to say these tests exist, right? We can't ignore that. And in fact, many patients are diagnosed prevalently before we launch our drug trials. So why on earth would we ask them to be retested if, in fact, they've been tested on high-quality tests? And when we talk about high-quality tests, there's, there's no clear definition of that, right? So we use a mix of validations, the, 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 the lab's uh, approval by New York State is another huge, um, valuable uh, marker of quality before we allow that enrollment. But, but essentially, we think that this pilot allows us to codify that and allows other um, sponsors to, to attempt to do that. Importantly, we're also really cognizant of the fact that labs can't perform a PMA. Not every laboratory can go through what our colleagues at MSK <coughs> went through with uh, 510K clearance for MSK Impact. So, so how do we make it good and, and, and solid for assess, assessing a quality while also not overly onerous so that no one can offer testing, right? That mm -hmm. neither. A bad, a bad quality test isn't great, but no test is also not great. Um, and so I, I think it does a nice job of striking that balance, and we hope to participate and help shape what, what we're asking from these laboratories. Yeah, I, I mean, like any pilot with FD, at FDA, it's always good to get in, I, I would think, from an outsider's perspective, to get in and be able to kind of shape it, see how it, um, how it develops. Um, Carly, I was hoping to, um, to ask you this question, and then, and then maybe uh, Joe follow on. You know, from a from a diagnostic company perspective, um, you know, what what policies would be important to ensure the accuracy and reliability of tests? Sure. Thank you so much. It's great to be here today. Um, it took me two hours to get into DC today because clearly everybody was coming today to the Friends of Cancer <laughs> Research uh, event. Um, I think just big picture. I think that there could not be a more exciting time to be in diagnostics right now. I think the role it plays in medicine and patient care just becomes increasingly important. And I think the innovation that's happening is not only remarkable in what it's, what is developing, but also the rate in which it's improving. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from an IVD perspective, what legislation really acknowledges is that IVDs are different. Um, diagnostics is different than the traditional medical device and it really needs its own framework and I think that's colliding with 
this remarkable time for innovative technologies and what we're seeing in pathology and sequencing. And we need to figure out a way to make sure that the FDA has the appropriate regulatory tools to have the appropriate regulatory touch, as you were saying, to ensure reliability, but not be so burdensome that people stop modifying to improve their tests to make sure that they come into FDA to get the appropriate validation um, and to make sure that this uh, really important medical products can continue to flourish and improve. Yeah. Right. Joe, do you have any, I'd love to get you in on this and respond to uh, what Carly said and what you've heard so far. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so maybe I pick up the term <coughs> quality because what we really want is high quality tests. But when you ask yourself, what does that really mean? It's accurate, it's reliable, but those are words you can measure them if you have the measurements. But when you really break it down from a lab director perspective and a product developer, there's basically multiple layers. Um, you know those beautiful dolls that are stuffed into one another, right? So there's a centerpiece, which is the actual test. The test can be measured with performance and you can regulate it clearly. But that test lives in an, in an environment of procedures, meaning do you validate that the patient with breast cancer had a brain biopsy and you got a brain sample, or the patient had bone metastasis and you got a decalcified fine needle aspiration, so that layer surrounding the test, which clearly affects the performance of the test, is called procedure. And that procedural layer is currently vaguely regulated, but it's not directly addressed when people talk about quality. It's just assumed that that would match the quality of the test. And then all of that comes together at a service layer because patients are offered, and we get to the patient access point here, in a healthcare ecosystem as a service. But if the service is broken, you can't access the test, meaning the procedure and the <coughs> test. So in other words, the quality that we're trying to, let's call it standardize or harmonize, is affecting all these different layers. And all those layers require a regulatory and policy landscape that affects not only one element, but all of them together to really assure that you have a high quality diagnostic. So I just wanted to briefly mention that because that's often forgotten. Because if you take a vetted, let's call it IVD, and you place it in a system where incompetent people are at work, it will not work. It will not perform at the same level of quality that was done at the initial stage. I believe that's often forgotten when it comes to like the practical uh, realities. The second part is we cannot anticipate what samples will arrive in the lab. I think you hear in the discussion some people say quality not sufficient or it won't work or something failed. But that is part and parcel of actual testing and product development. So knowing the failure rates is essential. No test is perfect. I think we have to wake up and say that's true. But capturing the failure rate often ends at the test level and does not take into account the procedure and the service layer. But when the sample gets lost by FedEx, you will not get a result. And that is part and parcel of the overall access to actual biomarker testing. So you can't always blame a laboratory or a lab developed test or an IVD, but it's the whole picture that we have to take into account. So building a regulatory and policy landscape around that is no simple task. So one thing, Big congrats to Friends of Cancer Research and to many other communities. You have to get all stakeholders together to discuss the topic, which I think we, we, we've done here. So first point, check. <laughs> Second is you have to constantly adopt, meaning continuous improvement and you know changes to those multiple layers is absolute key. That needs to be regulated. And the PCCP guidance is a good attempt, but it's by no means perfect. And I think it is a lot of work to get there. I just wanted to mention that. And then the third part, which is very near and dear to my heart, is the quality of the reports. We talk about highly complex technologies, and what all of that results in is basically a piece of paper with words on it. Typically HL7 or some very simplistic thing, is it positive or negative? That has to be understandable by the regulator and by the provider, but also by patients. Many laboratories work on patient understandable or eighth grade readability index text boxes. And I very much encourage that we, when we discuss optimization of, of testing, the accessibility to patients as, as one of the key points. So in quick summary, 
diagnostic quality at all levels, continuous improvements have to be regulated. And then the third part is that the report as the final output should definitely be legible and understandable by the various uh, stakeholders involved. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, thank you for that. So, Mike, from your perspective at MSK, um, what, what are, talk a little bit about, A, respond to what you've already heard, what are the implications for, um, for academic labs, and, and what are the considerations that need to be taken into account from your perspective as we think through all these issues? Sure, thanks, and, and since this is my first uh, um, time speaking, I just want to thank everybody uh, involved in this event for, for giving me the opportunity to, to represent our academic uh, labs and, and medical centers. And just to, to clarify, so in the introduction it was mentioned I have a research lab at Sloan Kettering. I also oversee our clinical sequencing program, the next generation sequencing yeah. with MSK Impact and MSK Access. So that's the perspective I'll be representing. And I think it's important uh, and appreciate the chance to acknowledge the critical role that academic labs and academic medical centers play in setting clinical standards, in training clinicians and laboratory technologists, uh, often developing tests for rare diseases or rare biomarkers where there's no um, you know, viable market for commercial development. And, and Nino mentioned the, the importance for that in drug development for, for new target therapies against rare targets. So uh, it's important to avoid regulatory policies that are going to either sort of price academic labs out of the market or specifically unfavorable to academic labs. Um, and you know, I was thinking for what Joe said, the, the procedure layer, um, it, that actually is a benefit, I think. You know, we, at MSK, we have over 300 laboratory developed tests that are run by um, you know, trained technologists, interpreted by pathologists in the context of other clinical and you know, previous molecular data that's available, which I think improves the quality and accuracy of the tests and the value that they provide. So I think it's one context where, yes, another com layer of complexity, but something where um, you know, there, there's additional value and, and safeguards against misinterpretation. Um, so at Sloan Kettering, we're, we're not afraid of regulation. I think we all share the same goals. You know, we, working in New York City, uh, in New York State, <laughs> more, you know, more relevant, um, adhere to the, the policies set by the New York State Department of Health. Our 300 laboratory de de developed tests have gone through uh, validation and approval to run clinically. Um, and with MSK Impact, we worked with the FDA to bring this through to authorization, uh, and it was a very positive partnership. Um, I think one of the big sticking points that we encountered from there was the topic of assay modifications. And we heard from the FDA the predetermined change control plans. I think this is super important. I'm really excited to hear that. I think that's something that's been successful with New York State is understanding um, what, you know, how can we build into the initial SOP a process for incorporating, you know, new instruments or new pipelines or, or new components of the test with demonstrated concordance or superiority um, as a way to make tests more accurate, more um, comprehensive, sometimes just faster to run, a faster sequencer, a faster pipeline. Um, so I think that is definitely something that you know, we, we would want to carry forward. Now, sometimes it requires a new validation altogether if we're validating a brand new specimen type or um, incorporating a whole new class of analysis, but other things where there's just an interchangeable component that we want to um, run X number of positive control samples and show concordance of results, I think that's going to allow these improvements and enhancements to, to come through faster. Um, and maybe just one final point, um, is that the way we consider uh, companion diagnostics um, is probably a little bit different than some of the other people up here and, and many of the others in the room. I think I completely understand the importance of CDX approvals for um, drug companies and, and for the FDA in bringing new drugs to market. I think in practice with the labs and, and physicians ordering the test and the patients receiving the result, the distinction is not always as meaningful. Um, and you know, I, I'm not fully up to speed on the, the new proposals for um, CDXs, it, it sounds like, you know, there might be um, some positive steps that have been made. I'll simply say, and this is a little bit of a swerve, but just for reimbursement policies mm -hmm. that specifically, you know, favor a CDX at, or, or disfavor um, analytically valid laboratory te developed tests, those can also be um, unfavorable to academic labs and something that uh, it, to some may actually be an existential threat. Great. Um, Joe, I know you were at Mass General. Do you have any uh, a perspective to share from from your now sort of past experience and and future and uh, current position? 
Uh, yes, um, I can. Uh, so we, we help bring two companion diagnostics to market. Um, we have, similar to what uh, Michael said, many, many different laboratory developed procedures on and offline all the time. I think the, the two points that I believe are very important for uh, medical centers is to do, they have the ability to deliver tests at a very, very rapid pace. So given how intricate diagnostics and therapeutics have been merged, and you know we have a patient representative on stage, we can talk maybe about the timeline. To get that process as fast as possible is the key element. Mm -hmm. So I didn't mention that earlier, but quality is also measured by when you get the test. And oncologic decision-making now has evolved into a realm where without the molecular test, you can't make a real informed decision. So we spend a lot of time at, at, at Mass General, and I know Memorial Sloan Kettering, and, and MD Anderson, and many of the other academic medical centers to ensure that it's really an integrated view of this. So the tissue is the issue, but then you get to you know, the molecular findings, and you need that, plus a tumor board, plus an interdisciplinary consultation to really render the best possible decision. And when you compare this to, you know, let's say, the, um, the real world outside academic medical centers, there's treatment delays. And many studies have been published right now. You know, I can cite, for example, the Integra Connect uh, study that shows uh, when patients have a test delay, they have actually worse outcomes because the decision cannot be made. Sometimes oncologists are forced to put patients on a treatment to just start, and that was molecularly uninformed, thereby wrong, and thereby a poor outcome is, is, is triggered. So the part that is, is so integral to you know, good oncologic care right now is diagnostic. So um, I think it is a good time to be in the diagnostic space, but at the same time, uh, we're collectively forced to push um, rapid integration of, of findings together. Okay, great. Um, Brittany, you, you and others from, from FDA have, have talked about the, the need to, that, that you see value in a modern framework for diagnostics. So um, we've talked a lot about policies that um, have been implemented, that are coming down the, the road. Um, so, but I'd like to invite you just to talk about um, whether the agency is exploring any new programs that would enable flexibility that maybe we haven't touched on as much yet, and then also talk a little bit about where there can be improvement within the current framework. Sure, yeah. I think I touched a little bit earlier on, on the modernized yeah. framework, so I think I'll, I'll spend time here uh, talking a little bit about um, you know, things coming down the pike, if you will. So we're always interested in hearing about challenges in development and and, and uh and validation. These types of forums are really helpful for us uh, so we can hear from you all um, collectively what is going on um, and we value those interactions. Um, we have several different initiatives um, ongoing that we've talked about today. So the, you know, initiating the reclassification for uh, most IVDs. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the oncology diagnostics pilot. Uh, Jeff mentioned it earlier. It's been mentioned several times on this, on this panel um, just to provide a little bit more perspective on that. You know, the goal there is to be able to set minimum performance characteristics for tests of a type uh, to meet. Um, and one of the key aspects of that uh, pilot program is being able to leverage the data in the drug trial to other tests of the same type. So, right, you have a set of clinical trial assays used in a drug trial. Um, those may not be the assays that are then used, um, you know, in clinical practice. And so we need information to be able to leverage that clinical validity data from those tests in that drug trial to those other tests. Um, and one way to do that is to have um, a reference method or a well-validated uh, method, orthogonal method, uh, reference materials. And so that is a key aspect of the pilot I wanted to touch on, um, you know, because we've talked a lot about making those materials and methods available, um, and that is one way, um, you know, we can help uh, expand the, the products that are eligible for that pilot, for example. Um, obviously, Jeff touched on the fact that right now, um, it is stalled. Um, we are seeing, you know, real-world challenges with that approach as well. Um, you know, Nino talked about the way that they go about identifying their clinical trial assays and making sure um, that they have appropriate validation data looking at what they do have, um, what the performance of those tests are. Um, as Jeff touched on this morning, that is not, you know, always the case. So, you know, there are 
the times where the drug trial is using um, information from a medical record, for example, and they don't know what test was used. So uh, they don't know, you know, what the, what the you know, it, we've used the term quality, but what the performance of that test is, because they don't even know which test was used. Um, there's other instances where, you know, there have been challenges, as Jeff mentioned, um, in getting validation data from the laboratories. Um, but that is a program, right, where we're looking um, uh, you know, around flexibility for development as an interim solution, as Jeff mentioned. Um, and we'll see, see where that lands, as he mentioned. Um, we also have the database recognition program um, to recognize human genetic variant databases as a source of valid scientific evidence that genetic and genomic tests can use. Um, and so when we went from, you know, talking about evolving technology, right, where we went from PCRs and microarray where you might have a single gene or a handful of genes and demonstrating clinical validity for a handful of variants um, to very large panels, whole exome, whole genome sequencing, um, where you're looking at a wide number of genes, a lot of different variants, um, being able to leverage databases um, as a valid source of scientific evidence um, to help reduce some of that regulatory burden. Um, you know, and having to provide that information for each variant, um, rather, you know, with the variant database recognition program, if we have a recognized database, uh, test developers can point to that database and say, you know, <coughs> it's recognized, it's a valid source of uh, scientific evidence, I'm going to use that. Um, it was recently done for the OncoKB database um, in a Tempest uh, submission for their tumor profiling indication. Um, and, you know, something that we're always interested in is um, working with the community to uh, set standards around validation um, or, or seeing the community set standards around validation um, and coming up with reasonable approaches uh, to doing so that we're able to leverage. So, right, FDA is only one piece in this ecosystem, um, as demonstrated here today. Um, you know, we make our decisions based on the information, the scientific evidence that's out there. Um, so, you know, seeing the community drive a uh, validation framework, in particular around rare disease, including the rare cancers, because um, as we've talked about today, it's a really challenging area um, where the patient population is small. There may be um, limited samples available for validation. So um, how can the community work together to come up with expectations for how to do validation and then performance too? Mm -hmm. um, so we have that information to leverage. Yeah. Yeah, all really important points. Thank you for that. Um, Leah, I want to bring it back to you before we start to look ahead. And, and my question to you is that in, in terms of patient education and, and, and communication, are there improvements that, that you would like to see um, or in how patients, what patients would like to see in, in how information about diagnostic tests, including their limitations and benefits, as we've already discussed, is, is conveyed to patients? Um, I think it's, it's critical that the communication from the provider um, is comprehensive and includes information about possibil possibilities for false negatives and false yeah. positives. If the testing procedure is more invasive, maybe communicating um, any uh, anticipated side effects of the procedure. Um, also, clear language that's easy for patients to understand. Um, w the other issue is in reporting, as Joe had already mentioned. As a patient, I'm not looking at these reports day in and day out like my provider does. So I don't want to be digging through the reports to find the information that's pertinent to me. So if there's a standard way to do that where it's front and center, easily available for the patients in language that's clear, um, that would be uh, an improvement, definitely. For instance, my pathology report from my first um, biomarker testing that was done via fish testing, it was pages and pages, including information on the biomarkers that I tested negative for. Mm -hmm. So it was long paragraphs of the, <laughs> about these other biomarkers. And as a patient, newly diagnosed, right, I just, I don't need to read all that um, extra information that's not relevant to me mm -hmm. and to my case. Um, the timeline for results, if maybe, uh, do these tests require prior authorization? Is that gonna delay the testing? Um, as far as the timeline, I've been blessed because I, from the time of my really bad CT scan till the time that I took my first dose of targeted therapy was four weeks, which is really quick in terms of all the testing and um, any other scans that I needed. But for most patients, that's not the reality. 
And it's that wait between the test and getting the results that's really agonizing for patients. So clear communication about that timeline. When are we gonna get the, the results? Patients now are very savvy. We're going to the portal and looking at the testing results before we even see the doctor. Mm -hmm. So if I can understand the results better, especially in that time frame between the results coming out on my portal, which could be as quick as me driving home from a scan, and I already look at my portal and the results are already there. If I can have a, a better understanding of those results even before I see the doctor, mm -hmm. that will make me come up with questions that are more relevant to my treatment. Because we also, as patients now, are very involved in shared decision making. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are things that in an ideal world, we as patients would no, really those welcome. Those are such great suggestions and recommendations, um, and it's great to hear them. And we're so happy that you're doing well. You've been in remission for a number of years. Is yes, it's right? been six years since that's, my diagnosis. I'm, nice. I'm currently on a targeted therapy and doing very well. Thanks. That's great. That's wonderful. <laughs> Um, okay, we've come to the last part of our, of our discussion up here, and then I'm going, we'll throw it out to, to uh, questions um, from the audience. Um, and this is where we get to look ahead a little bit on emerging, emerging technologies and, and future policies. So, um, Mike, I'd like to start with you and then invite Nina, Joe, Carly to, to comment as well. Um, talk a little bit about the challenges that you um, envision in the field of, of diagnostics and, and you know, what you might en encounter with the emergence of these new technologies like, like the um, digital pathology and how future policies might need to adapt to accommodate for those advances that we're, we're seeing. Well, I can mention some challenges, maybe not uh, as many solutions, but some things to be aware of. So you, you mentioned just now the digital pathology and mm -hmm. computational pathology. Yeah. I mean, I think AI in general is not just limited to computational pathology or radiology. I think it's going to be a feature incorporated e into conventional tests that will help improve and enhance the analysis that we provide. I'm just thinking of DNA sequencing. Um, I mean, we've gotten better. When we first submitted uh, MSK Impact to New York State, 11 years ago, you know, it was, it was a level of discomfort uh, from, you know, the, the, the oversight and the, you know, sort of regulation of these tests of anything that deviated from very hard cutoffs. We needed a specific variant allele fraction or a specific discrete number of molecules. And, you know, I think the, the, the field has, and sort of the comfort with more sophisticated probabilistic models of mutation calling has, has, has taken hold. AI, I think, with all the data that's being generated will, will take us to another level of being able to distinguish the signal from the noise and something that we're gonna be dealing with. Um, I think one other example, uh, maybe, you know, as the sensitivity of tests through increased and better technology improves, um, for instance, liquid biopsy tests looking for minimal residual disease. These are sometimes based on detecting just one or a small number of mutant DNA molecules in a sample. Well, showing reproducibility at the limit of detection um, is going to be harder because, you know, maybe another blood draw for that patient doesn't have any mutant molecules. So uh, these tests, as they get more and more sensitive, showing reproducibility of detection and establishing what the clinically meaningful detection levels really are um, is, uh, is, is going to be a challenge. Um, but, you know, I think what your question suggests and, and maybe a, a way to consider these as we go forward is just showing an increased importance on flexibility and assay modifications. If, if, a, if a new technology comes along um, that can increase the sensitivity or, or speed even by an order of magnitude, this um, is something we'd want to incorporate into our testing as soon as we possibly can. And that's a, that's a sort of a question of access and equity, right? If this mm -hmm. is a way to perform testing that reaches potentially underserved populations by increasing the throughput or the turnaround time of our tests, uh, we want to be able, with the appropriate guardrails, to incorporate these potentially game-changing technologies as yeah. soon as possible. Okay. You know, can you, do you, would you like to chime in on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll add in um, two other concerns. First of all, I, I just want to touch on the quality question because we, we, di we, we debate a lot internally what does a high quality test mean for genomics, right? So I'm going to add one other thing to what Joe and, and Mike uh, talked about, which is, you know, if you're, if you're testing a patient with non-small cell lung cancer, a high quality test ought to be able to detect with reasonable sensitivity 
all actionable biomarkers for that patient because it's really, to me, meaningless to have a negative test for eight out of the nine biomarkers, and then you'll have to do a, 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 another test for, for, that, for that other biomarker, for that ninth biomarker. So just I, I add that to the definition. Um, big concern for me is interoperability between platforms. So mm -hmm. even in the world of, of IHC, we've seen you know, many uh, examples, one in particular, around you know, one, one, one assay, one, one clone, one uh, um, uh, drug, and th that doesn't work. It's confusing to pathologists, it's confusing to physicians. We, we can't do that anymore. So I think as drug sponsors, as, IV as IVD manufacturers, as physicians, we need to push for an interoperability model. If there's going to be multiple clones, if there are going to be multiple approaches, and let's talk ahead of time on how we're gonna uh, coordinate that. And, and, and Friends of Cancer Research, I applaud for all of their efforts in, 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 in attempting to harmonize uh, methods early on. I think we need to do that as an industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and the final um, kind of concern that I have is kind of echoing what, what Mike was saying around access. You know, I was on a panel recently where we were talking about MRD, these like, you know, one in one times 10 to the negative six sensitivity MRD panels, great. That costs $10,000 a sample. Who is paying for that? Who has access to that? Why does it matter? Like really asking those very basic questions because at the end of the day, you can have the best technology, but if a patient doesn't have access to it unless they have $10,000 to pay out of pocket, it's useless to us. And we should not be talking about it actually yeah. in, in the absence of maybe a, a translational medicine trial. Right. So, so those are the two things I would, I would, I would kind of flag right. as things I worry about. Great. Carly, I'm going to give you a chance to, to be a final word on that question okay. before we move to the audience. Well, I think just picking up on the themes that you brought up, that none of us are going to figure this out alone. There really needs to be collaboration, and the sooner we can figure out how to have conversations like these, how to set up a collaborative community, how to work with Project Shield to advance interoperability, these are all uh, big, big challenges that we that need to be addressed. And the sooner we address them um, with some solution, we're going to be able to move forward. I think right now. Um, if we can just coalesce around, you know, what, defining the problem and figuring out what the first step in the solution is, and recognizing that we're going to need to come back because it's going to be iterative, um, that's the the most important that's thing. Great, thank you. Do we have questions <coughs> from the audience? Come on, um, are there roving mics, or are we having? I think maybe just um, come on up. Go ahead, yes, go ahead. Hi, um, so I wanna thank the panelists. It was very informative hearing about all the policies that are coming our way. So I wanted to talk about the reclassification announcement from yesterday. Of course, FDA announced that that would be focused <coughs> on infectious diseases and companion diagnostics, and then Dr. Shuren added, there might be more tests moving into moderate risk. Um, maybe this is directed at FDA, but happy mm -hmm. to hear panel six, um, you know, impressions on this. Are there any tests that you believe would need to stay in the class three high risk category for now? Like what, what shouldn't really move to moderate risk at this time? Yeah, I, um, I can start there. So I can't really speak to any individual test at this time. Um, as mentioned, we're at the very early stages of um, that process. So we have to go through a process of, you know, a proposed reclassification, a panel um, and things like that for the ones that we are um, considering for, for reclassification. Um, but certainly there are likely to remain, um, you know, some high risk tests. Um, you know, we're not intending to do all, um, you know, right now we estimate that it'd be most, um, at least 50% or so. So there will be some um, that would remain in that, that class three. Could I just throw in, yeah. not Please. specific to Rumi's question, but in terms of looking at that policy shift, if you look under like the valid tech cert framework of putting that many more tests in class two, it would just completely shift resources. It would fundamentally make that program so much more sustainable. So if you just, not that I'm saying valid's gonna pass the next year, I think we've talked about why it has political challenges, but I think just that kind of creative thinking by the agency just reinforces how these new regulatory frameworks could be so impactful to innovation in the field. Anyone else? If not, we'll move on. Thank you, that was a great question. Thanks, I, um, Kelly Gordon, Zadika DX. I have a more practical question. So I saw the reclassification yesterday. As someone who's proposed class two, 
as a CDX pathway in her precepts <laughs> and has been told, no, you need a PMA. Um, <laughs> <laughs> practically, you know, should we bring back some of those precepts? And on our current code development programs, should we assume as a default in class two, unless we're told otherwise when we do approach FDA? Because it would really help us out there um, working on these code development, um, because we know this reclassification is gonna take time. Yeah, so definitely for ones that are already classified, that's gonna take a, a period of time, as Jeff mentioned before. It's um, not a relatively short process, typically. Um, in terms of future class classifications for, for novel devices, if you have specific questions, of course, yes, come ask us, come talk to us um, about that. Um, in terms of you know looking forward, um, you know, looking at if there are um, classification regulations for your product type. In general, there has not been to date, right? Um, companion diagnostics, um, there's not a general uh, group of them that have been class two. There are some, um, but for the most part, uh, moving forward, those would likely be novel um, without a predicate, um, for example, if they were to be uh, moderate risk. So for, for most of the ones moving forward, um, if they were to be in that moderate risk category, um, they would be coming in first as a de novo and then as a, as a 510K. Sure, yep. Go ahead, please, with your question. Uh, I'm a still Russell Cohen. I work as an independent consultant, but I spent my time at all three centers at FDA at one point, including diagnostics. Here's my question, as I do consulting and I look at what's reported, I often rely on the databases that FDA provides for all the products it approves. I don't see that in the LDT space. So when you want to look at how LDTs perform, I, I, it's not just the numbers, it's, it's getting a sense of the studies that they performed and what they relied on to make the claims they have. It's often missing on their websites and I don't know whether, you know, who's doing that stuff. I know CLIA has particular regulations, but they're never really quite as thorough as FDA did. So my question is on these LDTs, when they get the same blessing that an FDA test does ultimately, what kind of evidence is going to be there so that the user knows what they're getting? And I realize a, a patient advocate may not have that skill set, but certainly the professional societies might very well decide to weigh in when they see how these tests are actually evaluated. So, can anyone answer? I, I'm wondering, is your question if an, if an LDT is authorized by the FTA, is the same information on our website as an as a, be a, a non-LDT? Is that the question? Yes, yeah. that is the case today. Yes, if an LDT uh, comes in and it is authorized, the same type of information is on our website as for a non-LDT. So future, they come in voluntarily now and they're, they're gonna have right. to change in the future. So are you going to have that same level so as mentioned before, we're not going to be speaking about what uh, would happen in the future um, as it relates to the proposed rule that's out there. Okay. Yep. Okay, great. Um, do we have one more quick question? Okay. We have uh, something minutes. you mentioned, Nino, I found very provocative um, on the MRDs, and you said how $10,000 a test, mm -hmm. access, people can pay out of pay. Yesterday, or a couple of days ago, NCCN published something that said, that there is lack of clinical utility for MRDs. I'd love for this August panel to discuss about the future of MRDs. Are we saying goodbye to them? What's going on? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start there. I, I didn't mean to be provocative. It's, it's, <laughs> I, I, I find it just infuriating at times when we, we, we live in our academic bubbles and we don't ask ourselves what's actually practical for our patients. But, but um, you know, I'm, I, I, I didn't see what came out by NCCN, so I have to take a look at that. Um, but uh, you know, internally, we we use MRD quite a bit for um, a few of our uh, a few of our drug development uh, approaches. The first is is honestly, and we'll talk about I'll talk about this on the 15th at the ACR FDA panel, uh, and drug optimization. So watching, looking at molecular response, and looking at uh, dose optimization uh, opportunities and, uh, as one of many pieces of data that we use clinically to to make assessments on on the appropriate dose. The second is really, and we're, we're just kind of moving into this is really in the adjuvant or early cancer setting to identify patients who potentially post-surgery or post-neoadjuvant therapy may actually require either intensification of, of dose or, or, or different uh, type of, 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 um, uh, of, of drugs. So, so those are the two areas that I think there's probably the most value for MRD. Uh, again, have, having seen, haven't, 
haven't having seen the, the document, I can't really speak more, more um, sagely about that. But the, the one area where I, I, I do see maybe some question is really in that metastatic setting as an earlier marker of, of progression. It's got to be pretty early uh, in order for it to make a difference for us to design a trial to in, intervene before uh, radiographic response. And so far, I, we just haven't seen that yet. But that's not to say with, with better technology, more accessible technology, um, that, that can't change. So I, I'm somewhat surprised by that. But again, I'd have to read the, the, the statement. If anyone else has thoughts. Um, I know we're right at time, but we also started late. And we have one last question from the Zoom that is flashing. So um, I'm going to ask it. Um, this is from Karen um, Espenshage, Espensheed. Um, asks, um, the desire for harmonization and diagnostics makes sense for clinical use. Um, however, the drive for innovation and competition between diagnostic developers will naturally result in differences between assays. So um, she asks, is, is there a way to harmonize and still promote innova innovative and novel approaches? Anyone want to take that one? I can try. Yeah. Um, so I think what the question is aiming for is what if there is an innovative solution that claims to have the same performance as another existing solution. Right. And I think we're waiting for a storm to happen because outside of diagnostics, there are AI giants looking at this and figuring out who is actually diagnosing cancer. Let's just revolutionize that without any respect for existing regulation and all the things that we care about. If that happens, there's like a discrepancy between the need for innovation and the you know, risk mitigation. And one very interesting regulatory grade program is the medical device development tool program by the FDA, where you can actually create data sets or other tools, for example, ground truth data sets that the FDA looks at with a clear pre-competitive aim to say this is for performance assessment. So this is not a device. Mm -hmm. This would be, for example, a data set that then various vendors, the designers, product developers can take and measure their performance against. Unfortunately, that program is not recognized a lot in the diagnostic space in pathology. I think in radiology it's used, and there's a few medical device development tools out there, but I just want to make a quick pointer for that because that might be a way to harmonize the need for innovation against uh, regulatory grade tools. That's great. All right. Karen, I hope that answers your question. Um, everyone, please join me in thanking our amazing panel, and, and what a great end. Well, uh, thank you all for your time uh, and joining the discussion today. There will be no more questions. Brittany, you're free to go about the down classification <laughs> initiative. Uh, sorry we didn't include that in your invite to join us today. Um, but I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us uh, this morning and this afternoon um, to everyone in the room and online. Um, it was a somewhat diverse set of topics that I think we were able to cover today, but each demonstrates the potential at hand in terms of advancing research and healthcare and the opportunities to shape policies into the future. Um, I want to thank an amazing group of people at Friends of Cancer Research that made all of these projects happen, today's meeting happen, and are allowing for a very exciting future. Um, they uh, are, are just a marvelous group of people, and thank you all who uh, have had the chance to work with them over the last several years. Um, <coughs> so we have a f busy couple of weeks coming up here at Friends. Sorry for what we've done to your inbox during the months of February, but you hope, we hope that you will consider joining us um, at our upcoming meetings uh, throughout the spring. But thank you for joining us today. Uh, safe travels, everyone. <laughs>